him and Isaiah. I mess up with yeah. Isaiah sometimes. Yeah. Sp- like trying to spell it out. All right. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so. All right. Okay. We're back on here, guys. All right. Sister Sadie's getting on here. Okay. And let me correct my mistake from last time. I'm going to actually record this to the cloud so it's a little bit easier to get up there on YouTube. All right. Hello. All right. All right, everyone. We're back on the record. All right. Um, we're going to be, my mom's going to be reading Ezekiel 22 for us right now. Oh, my bad. Chapter 20. Mm-hmm. Um, she's going to be using the NIV. I'll be having a comparison on the screen for the viewers and listeners um, from both the Septuagint and Masoretic here. So let me just change. Let's see. Select modules. Come on. Select Bible text to use. Okay. Uh, I'll do the ISR. Okay. Okay. All right, Mom, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, this is entitled Rebellious Yashrael. In the seventh year, in the fifth month on the tenth day, some of the elders of Yashrael came to inquire of Yahuwah, <clears throat> and they sat down in front of me. Then the word of Yahuwah came to me, Son of man, speak to the elders of Yashrael and say to them, This is what the sovereign Elohim says. Have you come to inquire of me? As surely as I live, I will not let you inquire of me, declares the sovereign Almighty. <clears throat> will you judge them? Will you judge them, Son of man? Then confront them with the detestable practices of their fathers and say to them, this is what the sovereign says. On the day I chose to Yashrael, I swore with uplifted hand to the descendants of the house of Jacob and revealed myself to them in Egypt. With uplifted hand, I said to them, I am the Elohim, the, the, Almighty, your Elohim, on that day, I Yahuwah, swore to your them, Elohim. Okay, Yahuwah, your Elohim. On that day, I swore to them that I would bring them out of Egypt into a land I had searched out for them, a land flowing with milk and honey, the most beautiful of all lands. And I said to them, each of you get rid of the vile images you have set your eyes on and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. But they rebelled against me and would not listen to me. They did not get rid of the vile images they had set their eyes on, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. So I said I would pour out my wrath on them and spend my anger against them in Egypt. But for the sake of my name, I did what would keep it from being profaned in the eyes of the nations that lived among and in whose sight I had revealed myself to the Israelites by bringing them out of Egypt. Therefore, I led them out of Egypt and brought them into the desert. I gave them my decrees and made known to them my laws, for the man who obeys them will live by them. Also, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between us, so they would know that I, Yahuwah, made them set apart. Yet the people of Yashrael rebelled against me in the desert. They did not follow my decrees, but rejected my laws, although the man who obeys them will live by them, and they utterly desecrated my Sabbaths. So I said I would pour out my wrath on them and destroy them in the desert. But for the sake of my name, I did what would keep it from being profaned in the eyes of the nations in whose sight I had brought them out. Also, with uplifted hand, I swore to them in the desert that I would not bring them into the land I had given them, a land flowing with milk and honey, most beautiful of all lands. Because they rejected my laws and did not follow my decrees and desecrated my Sabbaths, for their hearts were devoted to their idols. 
Yet I looked on them with pity and did not destroy them or put an end to them in the desert. I said to their children in the desert, do not follow the statutes of your fathers or keep their laws or defile yourselves with their idols. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. Follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Keep my Sabbath set apart that they may be a sign between us. Then you will know that I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. <clears throat> But the children rebelled against me. They did not follow my decrees. They were not careful to keep my laws, although the man who obeys them will live by them. And they desecrated my Sabbaths. So I said, I would pour out my wrath on them and spend my anger against them in the desert. But I withheld my hand. And for the sake of my name, I did what would keep it from being profaned in the eyes of the nations in whose sight I have brought them out. Also, with uplifted hand, I swore to them in the desert that I would disperse them among the nations and scatter them through the countries because they had not obeyed my laws, but had rejected my decrees and desecrated my Sabbaths. And their eyes lusted after their father's idols. I also gave them over to statutes that were not good and laws they could not live by. I let them become defiled through their gifts, the sacrifice of every firstborn that I might fill them with horror so they would know that I am the Almighty. Therefore, son of man, speak to the people of Yashroel and say to them, this is what the sovereign says. In this also your fathers blasphemed me by forsaking me. When I brought them into the land, I had sworn to give them and they saw any high hill or any leafy tree where they offered their sacrifices, made offerings that provoked me to anger, presented their fragrant incense, and poured out their drink offerings. Then I said to them, what is this high place you go to? It is called Bama to this day, which means high place. Okay. Therefore, say to the house of Yashrael, this is what the Sovereign Almighty says. Will you defile yourself the way your fathers did and lust after their vile images? When you offer their gifts, the sacrifice of your sons in the fire or passing through the fire, you continue to defile yourselves with all your idols to this day. Am I to let you inquire of me, O house of Yashrael? As surely as I live, declares the sovereign almighty, I will not let you inquire of me. You say, we want to be like the nations, like the peoples of the world who serve wood and stone. But what you have in mind will never happen. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Elohim, I will rule over you with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with outpoured wrath. I will bring you from the nations and gather you from the countries where you have been scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with outpoured wrath. I will bring you into the desert of the nations and there, face to face, I'll execute judgment upon you. As I judged your fathers in the desert of the land of Egypt, so I will judge you, declares the sovereign almighty. I will take note of you as you pass under my staff and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge you of those who revolt and rebel against me. Although I will bring them out of the land where they are living, yet they will not enter the land of Yashra. Then you will know that I am Yahuwah. As for you, O house of Yashrael, this is what the sovereign Elohim says. Go and serve your idols, every one of you. But afterward, you will surely listen to me and no longer profane my set-apart name with your gifts and idols. For on my set-apart mountain, the high mountain of Yashrael, declares the Sovereign Almighty, there in the land, the entire house of Yashrael will serve me. And there I will accept them. There I will require your offerings and your choice gifts along with all your set-apart sacrifices. I will accept you 
as fragrant incense when I bring you out from the nations and gather you from the countries where you have been scattered. And I will show myself set apart among you in the sight of the nations. Then you will know that I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. When I bring you into the land of Yashrael, the land I had sworn with uplifted hand to give to your fathers, there you will remember your conduct and all the actions by which you have defiled yourselves, and you will loathe yourselves for all the evil you have done. You will know that I am Yahuwah. When I deal with you for my name's sake, and not according to your evil ways and your corrupt practices, O house of Yashrael, declares the sovereign Yahuwah. <clears throat> the word of Yahuwah came to me. Son of man, set your face toward the south. Preach against the south and prophesy against the forest of the southland. Say to the southern forest, hear the word of Yahuwah. This is what the Sovereign Almighty says. I am about to set fire to you, and it will consume all your trees, both green and dry. The blazing flame will not be quenched, and every face from south to north will be scorched by it. And see that I, Yahuwah, have kindled it. It will not be quenched. Then I said, Ah, Sovereign Yahuwah, they are saying of me, isn't he just telling parables? It's a nervy thing to say after all of that. <clears throat> mm. Seer. Basically, they're saying, isn't he just telling a story? Mm. Like they're not taking seriously what he's saying. I find that interesting. Um, I was actually looking at something... <coughs> from uh the st i was just writing down because there's a future study that we're going to do about how to find yahush in the tanakh and mm -hmm. obviously we're going to use the targum because it's a lot more literal uh, where to find the person the word of yahuwah in in the torah um uh, and uh, what you just brought up reminded me the story of lot in sodom and gomorrah in the targum of jonathan it it's more it's kind of that idea. It actually says he rained showers of favor upon them, meaning like rain upon them, like regular rain, not hail, mm -hmm. uh, as a opportunity for them to repent. But they chose not to repent. And then he sent the brimstone and, you know, the fiery hail. Hellfire brimstone. So let's see here. Um, I think it's Genesis. So, and it, what it reminds, the reason it reminds me of that is because you said they don't, they're acting like, you know. They that, think this is just a story. They think this is just a story or they think it's. It's uh, not serious. That that he, this is not serious business. That his wrath is not real. Right. All right. So let me see here. Or what chapter in Genesis is it? It's. um. Well, what's interesting. Here we go. Mm -hmm. So Genesis 19, 24 in the Targum in the Targum of Jonathan reads as follows. Okay. This is the Aramaic version of the Torah here. It's a, it's a paraphrase manuscript of the Torah it says here. And the word of Yahuwah, Yahusha had caused showers of favor to descend upon Sodom and Gomorrah to the inhabitants Hold on, what the heck? The ha to the intent that they might work repentance, but they did not. So that they said, wickedness is not manifest before you. He doesn't see our sins. I'm paraphrasing, but literally the word for word is uh, wickedness is not manifest before you. So he, so it'd be like today, he doesn't see our sins. He doesn't see what we're doing in secret. Mm -hmm. Behold then, there are now sent down upon them sulfur and fire from before mm -hmm. who? The word of Yahuwah from heaven. So Yahusha himself uh, sent fire and brimstone on, uh, on Sodom and Gomorrah. 
And he overthrew those cities and all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities and the herbage of the earth. And his wife looked after the angel to know what would be in the end of her father's house, for she was of the daughters of Sodom. Because she sinned by salt and was manifestly punished. Behold, she was made a statue of salt. So basically, she was staying back. Mm -hmm. You know, Sodom's <laughs> wife did not want to leave with, uh, I mean, uh, Lot's wife did not want to leave Sodom. So anyway, so, and we know the rest of the story. So the, the reason I brought that up is because my mom was talking about, she got the idea from what we just read in Ezekiel that oh, they didn't really care. They didn't think you who was going to punish them for their sins. Oh, mm -hmm. He doesn't see us, you know, so. Anyway, so we're we're gonna go to some let's see some uh, notes I have here. I don't know how many times you you who had to keep reiterating you have profaned my Sabbaths. You have profaned my Sabbaths. Yeah, Probably three, yeah, how many three, times three different the times. The Sabbaths have been mentioned. That's exactly right. Verse twelve, verse thirteen, verse sixteen is interesting because verse sixteen gives the idea there's this doctrine out that idols are only images of wood and stone and that's the only way you can have an idol is by bowing down to an idol or, I love when he gets or serving he says, go serve them go or, serve them. or going to serve like the point i'm trying to make is an idol is more than just wood and stone and actually right. Right, right, right. the septuagint instead of idol here it says they went after the imaginations of their hearts yeah, so that shows that you can have an idol in your life without it being a statue true that's the point that you who is trying to make and that the septuagint is making here is that you don't it doesn't need to be a physical quote-unquote mm -hmm. graven image for it to be an idol and i think we've we've learned we kind of take certain isolated verses from the torah mm -hmm. and we kind of get that idea that it's only physical things can be idols. It, it only can be, it has to be something tangible or physical statue for it to be idol. And um, yep, go ahead, Brother Joshua. Yeah, so uh, on that point, Colossians 3, 5, it says, Modify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Mm -hmm. Yep. And he's had it. Perfect. <clears throat> yeah. Go serve them, every one of you. <laughs> he's had it. I like the Son of Man Bible. They, they, they definitely paraphrase this a little bit. Woo. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> They put in parentheses after the sexual morality, child molestation, rape, fornication, adultery, bestiality, homosexuality, lesbianism, LGBT. Oh no, kidding! <laughs> the son of, it's a very modernized Bible. You're yeah, not it's kidding. it's You're uh, not kidding. pornography, foreign pagan lineage, incest, prostitution, etc. Uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is adultery. Probably the foreign pagan lineage would be you marrying into a pagan wife or vice versa. What's that scripture called? What is that scripture? Sorry. Um, Colossians 3 5. The Son of Man Bible is pretty much added in parentheses here, all this, but pretty much I don't see huh? anything wrong with what they're adding in here because I don't it's, either. it's all included in the text that's that's being referenced. I mean sexual morality is all those things uh you know you're the members of your flesh is all these things being listed in parentheses um to to marry a pagan wife is fleshy that's not of the spirit you know uh, unequally yokedness um mm -hmm. you know that's incest is un, is, is of the flesh prostitution is of the flesh so everything the guy's putting in parentheses i, I don't have any problem with bestiality of the flesh okay so and we just talked about actually bestiality earlier in the Leviticus portion. So, yeah, that's against Torah, too. So, anyway, sometimes I like the Son of Man Bible because they paraphrase a little bit. Um, let me see here. So, we're going to go to now. We already talked about profaning the Sabbath thing. The imaginations of the heart. We already went through that. Okay. All right. My name shall not be profaned among the nations. Mm -hmm. 
Notice how it says shall not be. So future tense. Mm -hmm. Obviously, his name is profaned among the nations. I mean, we could have a whole study about that, how that's happening at this moment. Um, especially <laughs> even in America, you got people that are, 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 are in this walk that don't want to give up God and Lord. Okay, that's, that's profaning his name. Okay, calling him, calling him God, calling him Lord, calling, calling him Adonai. You're profaning his name by doing that. Okay, so he has one name. He gave, he gave one name to his people in Exodus 3.15. He did not say, oh, it's okay for you to call me by name master, for you to use God as my name, for you to use Lord as my name. He never said that. So the, even to today, this prophecy is reigning true. Eventually, it seems like a future prophecy, what it seems like here, no longer among the Gentiles will his name be profaned. And I like how he says, I will deal with you for my name's sake. But I worked so that my name should not be at all profaned in the mm -hmm. sight of the Gentiles, in the midst of whom they are. So why is it profaned among the Gentiles? Doesn't seem like it's the Gentiles' fault. Seems like it's his people's fault. Because mm -hmm. it says, of whom they dwell. So it's because his people are scattered among the nations and yeah. they're, they're taking with them all their man's traditions that they learned from the tradition of the elders and trying to hide Yahuwah's name. In the midst of whom they are, among whom I was made known to them in their sight to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So Yahuwah is putting all the blame on his people. He ain't, he ain't blaming the heathen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know what? You, I don't want my name to be profaned anymore among, among the nations where you are. Okay, verse 5. And you shall say to them, thus says Yahuwah, from the day that I chose the house of Yashiral, and became known to the seed of the house of Yaakov, I was known to them in the land of Egypt and helped them with my hand. Yeah. Who's his hand? That's Yahusha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and the reason I also made a note of this is because lovely, 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 lovely Masoretic text needs to add Adonai in front of Yahuwah's name here. So if you look in the Greek, there's only one kurios, and it's all caps. That's not Adonai. That would be the Greek equivalent to H3068, which is Yahuwah. Okay? So what we see here is that the Maserites are adding a word there that's not supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. And they do that a lot. Okay, and uh, uh, after our study today, I'll give you a link if you want to the historical origin to Adonai, where Adonai came from, and why we should not be using it to call the Father by. Okay. All right. So verse three. It's not going to be good. No, it's not a good thing. I can tell you right now, it's not a good thing to use that. All right, so again, we have, oh, what do you know? Again, yeah, you can count on the Maserites that they're going to do it more than one time. Here we go. Here we go with that on I. Putting it before you, who, uh, okay. And for some reason, the ABP is putting it there, even though there's no Greek Strong's number there. It has an asterisk there, which means it's not in the Greek, Okay. That's why there's an asterisk there. There's no number there, okay? If you go into the Greek OT+, plus, which is another Strong's-linked one, you will only see in the Greek, you're going to only see, let's see here, where's the G2962? I think it's all the way at the end here. Yeah. Kurios, G2962. There's only one Kurios there. And those that claim that Kurios is equivalent to Adonai, why isn't there two Kurioses in that verse then? If 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 it originally read as Adonai then Yahuwah in the Greek, the equivalent would be Kurios then Kurios. But since there's only one Kurios, it shows that the Mazerites actually added the word Adonai in front of 
the H3068 Yahua. Okay. All right. So moving on here. So that's the Greek OT key to the Strongs there. Greek Old Testament Septuagint. That's my source for that. Quick question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, brother, quick question. Um, I noticed it in a lot of the uh, Greek uh, words that they've changed and all. They have a lot of IOS, US. Why is that so? Is that just because that's part of their language or they? Um, well, the US you know, is it? to. The U.S. is to honor Zeus, not the O.S. The O.S. is probably legitimate, like Curry Os. That that's legitimate, but you'll see certain names that have the U.S. at the end. That's to honor Zeus, pretty much. That's to honor the in their religion, Zeus is the replacement for Yahuwah. So when you go into their mythology and you research their religion, um, their history, as they like to call it, because they don't believe it's mythology, they believe it's their real physical history um they basically they replaced yahua with zeus in their religion zeus is the god of the gods he's king of the gods god of the gods uh you know he's pretty much the head honcho so to them every name should have us at the end of it in their language because it honors their deity kind of like similar in the hebrew originally in the hebrew um every prophet had yahoo at the end of it so basically the greeks replaced yahuwah with zeus is what happened and they started monkeying with the names that's why you get us at the end of it jesus uh percy us and perseus is even a, a a demigod child of zeus basically a hybrid giant god in their religion that was the son of zeus and a mortal woman um wow yeah so basically the greeks were similar to the hebrews but the problem with them is that they're honoring a false god they're honoring uh uh you know one one of the fallen angels that went into the daughters of men as their god of the gods in their divine council of the angels rather than in the real story in the real psalms 82 story that's real in reality, Yahuwah is the mighty one of mighty ones, and he is the king of the mighty ones, as Psalms 82 would read. And I and I would suggest this is the correct interpretation of this chapter. Elohim stands in the assembly of the angels, and among the angels he will judge. So what, what Greek mythology religion has done took this concept of the divine assembly in heaven, in the third heaven, and Yahuwah's council of angels with him. You can even see this in, in the in the movies, um, Clash of the Titans and all that. Uh, pretty much they, they twisted and perverted the story where one of the fallen angels now be puts gets put in Yahuwah's place as as the god Zeus. So, and that's that's pretty much what their religion is about. They worship the the Bene Alahim that sinned. They actually that's who they worship. Um, and th they don't hide it either. They, if you watch any Greek mythology movie, they'll talk about, oh, they made it with human women. They had children with them that are demigods, half God, half human, half God. I mean, it, their, their, their religion is very much based on Genesis 6 narrative. They're, that's pretty much what their religion is. Anyway, but moving on here. So let's see. Um, I think that's it. Um, also, I found it interesting the, uh, in verse one of this chapter, before we go to chapter 22 here, um, there's something missing in the Septuagint I was surprised to see. Now, I don't know if the Masoretic added it for whatever reason, but in the Masoretic, it, it says that it occurred in the fifth of the month, the fifth month of that year. In the Septuagint, it only says in the seventh year on the 15th day of the month. It doesn't tell you which month. Hmm. So I find it weird. I mean, who knows, We, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, did did did, did the Masorites add the fifth month to, like, the fifth, the word, the fifth there? You know, I don't know. So that's that's just something to look more into. I really can't tell you which one is correct on that one because uh, I, I would need to see uh, a original 
um, manuscript of both manuscripts to see um, what is the case. My gut feeling is telling me that most like the Maserites added mm -hmm. um, fifth to that for whatever reason. Maybe they thought that would help the reader. I don't know. They probably added it there. Um, anyway. Um, so we're going to go to chapter 22. All right, here we go. Ezekiel 22. And the word of Yahuwah came to me saying, so already we got the word of Yahuwah here. You son of man, will you judge the bloody city? Yea, declare you to tell, uh, declare you to her all her iniquities, all her lawlessnesses. You shall say, thus says Yahuwah And Actually, let me um, put the parallel back on here just so I catch the differences. Already, already we got one. That didn't take long. All right. So, in their blood which you have shed, you have transgressed, and in your devices which you have formed, you have polluted yourself, and you have brought near your days, and have brought on time of years. Therefore have I made you a reproach to the Gentiles and a mockery to all the countries. Mm -hmm. To those near you and to those far distant from you, they shall mock you. You that are notoriously unclean. Whoa, Septuagint a little bit stronger there. Notoriously unclean. And I find it funny, you know, a rapper, uh, Biggie Smalls, used to call himself the notorious one or the notorious B.I.G., I find it interesting that notorious is not actually a good thing. No. <laughs> so Ezekiel 25, 22.5, LXX has notorious. All right. Okay, notoriously unclean, abundant in lawlessnesses. Behold, the princes of the house of Yasharal have conspired in you, each one with his kindred, that they might shed blood. In you they have reviled father and mother, and in you they have behaved unrighteously toward the stranger. They have oppressed the orphan and the widow, and they have set at not my set-apart things. It's an important note to take down here. And in you they have profaned my Sabbaths. There are robbers in you to shed blood in you, and in you, they are in the, on the mountains. Now, this definitely has to do with the sacrifices like we read in Leviticus, you know, um, 16 to 20. So, obviously, this doesn't just mean that they they sinned because they ate on a mountain. No, this, mm -hmm. is, this is talking about some weird occult rituals, most likely. They're the most likely eating sacrifices of demons on the mountains. They have worked wickedness in the midst of you. In you, they have uncovered the father's shame. See, told you. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go with this. Uncovering their father's nakedness. And in you, they have humbled her that was set apart for uncleanness. So that's talking about sleeping with a woman in her period. They have dealt unlawfully each one with his neighbor, his wife. Okay. Let's write down the important ones here. And each one in wickedness has defiled his daughter-in-law. And in you, they have humbled each one his sister, the daughter of his father. In you, they have received gifts to shed blood they have received in you interest and usury increase and by oppression they have brought your wickedness to the full and have forgotten me says yahuwah was that verse 12 okay and if I if I shall smite my hand at your lawlessnesses which you have accomplished, 
which you have worked and at your blood that has been shed in the midst of you. So like we mentioned from the Targum there, Yahusha executing the wrath of the father there by hand. Okay. Shall your heart endure? Shall your hands be strong in the days which I bring upon you? I, you who have spoken and will do it. And I will scatter you among the nations and disperse you in the countries and your uncleanness shall be removed out of you. And I will give heritages in you in the sight of the nations. You shall know that I am Yahuwah. And the word of Yahuwah came to me saying, Son of man, behold, the house of Yasharal are all become to me as it were mixed with brass. Interesting. And iron and tin and lead, they are mixed up in the midst of silver. What an interesting little uh, parallel there to uh, Daniel chapter 2. It's almost like he's comparing mm -hmm. them to uh, the beast kingdom. Right. Saying they're mixed <laughs> with iron. <laughs> That's not a good thing. That's not a good comparison there. So, therefore, say... Thus says Yahuwah Elohim. Oh my goodness, again? These Mazerites, I swear. Enough with this. As silver and brass and iron and tin and lead are gathered into the midst of the furnace to blow fire into it, that they may be melted, so will I take you in my wrath, and I will gather and melt you. And I will blow upon you in the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the midst thereof. As silver is melted in the midst of the furnace, so shall you be melted in the midst thereof. And you shall know that I, who have poured out my, my wrath upon you. The word of Yahuwah came to me saying, Son of man, say to her, you are the land that is not rained upon. Neither has rain come upon you in the day of wrath. In the midst of her are as roaring lions seizing prey. Okay, who's princes? Okay, devouring souls by oppression and taking bribes. And your widows are multiplied in the midst of you. Her priests also have set at naught my law. Now that's a big important verse there. Ezekiel 22, 26. They have set at naught my law and profaned my set apart things they have not distinguished between the set apart and profane nor have they distinguished between unclean and clean and have hidden their eyes from my sabbaths and i was profaned in the midst of them just a quick expounding here the levites were were in leadership roles in the old covenant that they basically were supposed to be the leaders they were supposed to make sure people are keeping the commandments they are supposed to be yeah. You know, in a way, intercessors, in a way, um, you know, they're 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 in that priest intercessory role. So they're supposed to be, you know, keeping you who is commands and really supposed to be the ones. Um, the difference between profane and clean, and they didn't do that. That's why you see later on, he has to choose the sons of Zadok to replace them temporarily. Okay. Her princes in the midst of her are as wolves ravening to shed blood and that they may get dishonest gain. And her prophets that daub them shall fall that see vanities that prophesy falsehood, saying, Thus says Yahuwah, when Yahuwah has not spoken. Right. Okay, that sorely oppress the people of the land with unrighteousness and commit robbery, oppressing the poor and needy and not dealing righteously with the stranger. That I sought from among them a man behaving uprightly and standing before me perfectly in the time of wrath so that I should not utterly destroy her, but I found him not. So I have poured out my wrath upon her in the fury of my anger. To accomplish it, I have repaid their ways on their own heads, says Yahuwah Elohim. Okay. 
that's I believe that's the last verse of the chapter there. Okay, Ezekiel twenty two thirty one. Okay, we're going to just recap this chapter before we go to Amos chapter 9, All right? So, a lot of stuff in this chapter. Um, okay, we're going to go to, let's see here, I'm going to start backwards here. So, here we go. We got uh, Adonai being added here, Yahuwah Alihim in the Septuagint, Okay. Right, because Theos is the Greek equivalent to, to the Hebrew Alihim. Okay, so all right, so that's checked off. We just went to that. All right, so now we're gonna go. Let's see if we have verse twenty-eight. Adonai is added here. In the Greek, it's thus says Yahuwah, and Yahuwah has not spoken. Okay. All right. So, moving on here. Uh, let's see here. And by the way, any of you that have like the ISR or the or the uh, any type of restore name scriptures, they might not put it in English as Adonai. They might just put it as um, the master or the sovereign and then, then you know, Yahuwah or something like that. So just keep an eye out on that. You're not going to see literally in the English Adonai. Only if you have a Sefer will you see that where they indicate where the Adonai has been added. Okay, so let's see here. All right, verse 26. Her priests have said, and not my law. We already talked about that, so not my law, profane my Sabbaths. Okay, all right. Let's go to verse 19 here. We already talked about notorious. Okay, so let's, let's go to verse 19 here of this chapter. So we have another Adonai here, verse 19 added there. Like I said, in, in some of your English Bibles, what they'll do for Adonai, they'll put sovereign and then have the all caps Lord for Yahuwah. So, so in the Septuagint, it would be Yahuwah and then Alihim. Okay. All right. So moving on to verse 18 here. Okay. Again, I mentioned about the iron that his people have become like mixed with iron and brass and tin and lead. They are mixed up um, in the midst of the silver. Interesting correlation there. You can kind of connect that with Daniel 2, 243, which I'll go to real quick. Um, Daniel 243. All right. And this is talking about the last beast kingdom, you know, right before Yahushua's return. Okay. When you see the iron mixed with the earthenware clay, they shall be mingled with the seed of mankind, but they shall not cleave to one another, as iron does not mix itself with earthenware or with clay. So we see that it's not a good thing when you who is talking about his people being mixed with silver. That's not a good thing. Um, so, all right. So let's see here. We did that. We did that. We did that. Let's see if there's any others to go to verse. All right. We already talked about verse 13. He's going to use his hand <coughs> to execute his wrath. Okay. Let's go to verse 12 of Ezekiel 22. Okay, and we're going to go back to the parallel here. Okay, verse 12. In you they have taken gifts to shed blood. You have taken usury increase, and you have greatly 
gained of your neighbors by extortion and have forgotten me, says Yahuwah. And you see, here you go, Adonai at it again. All right. So, got that. Let's go to verse 11 here. Okay, you have defiled his daughter-in-law, and you've hum humbled each one's sister, the daughter of his father. So that's what we just read about earlier today. Uh, all the commandments about incest and all that, what you're not supposed to do. Okay. All right. In you, they have uncovered the father's shame. So we talked about that. Uncovering your father's nakedness, okay, but was set apart for her uncleanness. So that's talking about uncovering a woman's nakedness when she's in her period. All right. And let's see, we got three cross references left, and we're going to go to Amos 9. Okay, so Ezekiel 22 8. They have set it not my set apart things, and in you they have profaned my Sabbath. So again, mentioning. His Sabbath being profaned. Okay. All right. You shall say, thus says Yahuwah Elohim. And then, of course, again, the Masoretic in verse 3 here puts Adonai in front of Yahuwah. They add Adonai there another time. Okay. And then you got Ezekiel 22, verse 1. The word of Yahuwah came to me saying, okay, so we see Yahusha automatically mentioned in the beginning of this chapter. And that's about it. All right, we are moving on to Amos chapter 9. And we're only going to be, I think, reading up to verse 15. Well, I think there's only 15 verses in the chapter, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, so this will be a very quick chapter to get through. Okay, Amos chapter 9. I saw Yahuwah standing. Oh, wow, here we go. Here we go. Not, not surprised. I saw Yahuwah standing on the altar, and he said, smite the mercy seat. So connection here with the mercy seat. And the poor shall be shaken and cut through into the heads of all. And I will slay the remnant of them with the sword. And not one of them fleeing shall escape. Not one of them striving to save himself. Interesting. And yeah, you can't save yourself. Shall be delivered. That's a very interesting verse there. You can run, but you cannot hide. All right, verse 2. Though they hid themselves in Sheol, hell, Sheol, okay? So hell's not the lake of fire, guys. All right? Shall my hand drag them forth? My hand. Okay, Amos 9.2. So we see here, hell is the equivalent to Sheol. And his hand is dragging them down. All right. And though they go up to heaven, hmm, could this be a reference back to the Tower of Babel? Mm, maybe. There will I bring them down. Hmm. Interesting. All right. If they hid themselves in the top of Carmel, there will I search them out. Actually, this is reminding me of Obadiah chapter 1. I'm going to write that down as a reference after we read this chapter just to kind of figure out what the context is about. They're reaching up to him, and he's going to bring them down. Okay. If they should go down from my presence, 
into the depths of the sea, you know, the waters of the deep. Oh boy, <laughs> this is going to be bursting people's bubbles here that uh, Satan can't uh, the be used. can't yeah. be used for Yahuwah's purpose, all right? Okay, by the way, serpent is a mistranslation here. It should actually say the dragon, okay? Okay, the depths of the sea, where will, there will I command the dragon and he shall bite them. Okay, so that's probably either, either, and I'm, you know, I'm open to different interpretations of who the dragon he's referring to, because you could honestly say it's fair to say that he's just talking about the creature Leviathan. I mean that, uh, you know, I'm open to that type of interpretation of that verse, because, you know, Leviathan's like a sea dragon, so I mean that, you know, but I'll just show you in the Greek real quick, guys, that, uh, that it should be dragon. It's actually dracon for verse three there. It's not serpent. There's a different Greek word for serpent. Uh, see? Dracon. Okay. Dragon. All right, so where we get the Greek, uh, the English word dragon, we get from this Greek word, dracon. Okay, um, it's a dragon. So anyway, moving on. Okay. So. And if they should go into captivity before the face of their enemies, there I will command the sword and it shall slay them. And I will set mine eyes against them for evil. Not for toe, not for two. For Yahuwah, Yahuwah Elohim Almighty. Can you see? I don't know. I hear they put there. Emos 9.5. Miseretic text adds. Adonai there, okay. Yahuwah Almighty, instead of Sabaoth, that's interesting. It takes hold of the land and causes it to shake and all that inhabit it shall mourn. And its destruction shall go up as a river and shall descend as the river of Egypt, right? It is he that builds his ascent up to the sky. Interesting. And his and establishes his promise on the earth. Kind of sounds a reference like to the rainbow there. Who calls the water of the sea and pours it on the face of the earth. So he actually calls it. He commands the sea by name, which we actually see Yahusha doing in the Brit Hadashah, where he calms the sea and he tells it, you know, tells it to calm down. He, so he pours it on the face of the earth, okay, flat, okay. When you think of a face of something, it's flat, it's circular flat, okay. Yahuwah Almighty is his name. Yes, it is. <clears throat> okay. Are you not to me as the sons of the Ethiopians? Oh boy. Children of Yasharal, says Yahuwah. Did I not bring Yasharal out of the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Cappadocia and the Syrians out of the deep? Behold, the eyes of Yahuwah Elohim are upon the kingdom of sinners, and I will cut it off from the face of the earth so amos 9 8 deliver the cup you want to help me make sure you finish that bath i got the bath okay bye make sure you uh okay. dry everything put everything away cut off you know i don't cut off from the face of the earth only i will not utterly cut off the house of Jacob, says yahuwah for i will give commandment and a swift and sift the house of Yashar all among all the Gentiles as grain is sifted in a sieve, yet a fragment shall not in any wise fall upon the earth. Okay, so that's talking about the scattering among the nations there. Okay. 
All right. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword who say calamity shall certainly not draw near nor come upon us. In that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David. Notice how it says in that mm -hmm. day. Okay. This is how we know when Yahushua is returning. Okay. This, there's always context with prophecy here. So in that day, he's talking about the day of Yahuwah. Okay. I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. And he's talking about the temple, guys. Okay, he's talking about a physical temple. He's not talking about the human body. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I'm going to make a little note of that for a future study. The tabernacle of David. Because think about it. Who built the original temple? Solomon, right? Solomon's of the lineage of David. So it, the, the temple of Solomon would have been considered... The tabernacle of David. Okay. All right. That is fallen and will rebuild the ruins of it and will set up the parts thereof that have been broken down and will build it up as in the ancient days. This is what exposes the idea that he's talking about Herod's temple. Because I know. The Jewish interpretation is going to be like, this already happened. Herod's temple was built up. No, it wasn't built up as it was in the ancient of days. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Nope. Nope, it wasn't. Because that's a reference to Yahuwah, a title to Yahuwah. So he's actually talking about in, in Israel's prime. When they actually served the father. That's why he's probably using the phrase ancient of days there. Okay. That the remnant of men and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called. Notice how it says. And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called. So again, Gentiles are able to be grafted in. Your ethnicity doesn't matter. Your ethnicity is not going to get you salvation. Okay? All through the scriptures, we see this concept. Job was an ethnic Edomite. Okay? Mm -hmm. Upon whom my name was called. All right. Verse 13, behold, the days come, says Yahuwah, when the harvest shall overtake the vintage and the grapes shall ripen at seed time and the mountains shall drop sweet wine and all the hills shall be planted. I mean, this is another clue. This is future context. <laughs> In Yahushua's day, do you really think their harvest was overtaking their the, the vintage of the, of the grapes? Uh, I don't know. I, I really doubt it. This, this is all millennial, in my opinion. I really believe this is millennial context. And I will bring, uh, I will turn the captivity of my people Israel, not just the house of Judah, okay? They shall rebuild the ruined cities and shall inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and shall drink the wine from them. And they shall form gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them on their land and they shall no more be plucked up from the land which I have given them, says you who almighty. So this has to be future here. Yeah. This has to be because guess what? They got plucked up again mm -hmm. in 70 AD. They got plucked up again. Mm -hmm. So so if you interpret this as, as when Yahushua was on the earth or first century AD, then you're going to have a huge problem. You're, uh, you know, Yahuwah is not a liar. So He's saying it's never going to happen again when that happens. That means that hasn't happened yet in verse, uh, what is it? Verse 15. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So we're done with Amos here. Uh, I think I pretty much expounded upon all this stuff. Okay. Yeah, I think we are going to go now to the next portion here. Um, and I think we're going to have a new reader here, actually. So we're going to be, technically, we're staying on the 
prophets portion, but we're going to another section of, of Ezekiel here. So bro, Brother Dennis is going to be reading. Let's see here. Actually, yeah. Yeah, Brother Dennis is going to be reading for us Ezekiel 28 to 31. Okay. So Ezekiel 28 to 31. Brother Dennis, whenever you're ready, feel free. <laughs> Whenever you're ready, Brother Dennis, um, just unmute yourself. Um, I think I heard somebody snoring. No, nah, he's been muted the whole time. He's been, uh, I'm just waiting for him to unmute his phone. Because he's calling in. He's he's called in from the phone. So I'm, I'm just waiting for him to unmute. You there, Brother Dennis? All right. Um, okay. Let's see here. All right. All um, right. Let's see. Uh oh, he had a problem. All right, he just had to drop out. He might have a reception problem. Um, if anyone else can jump in, uh, let's see here. Uh, Sister Sadie, you think you could read twenty to thirty one for us? Or I could read some of it. That might be a lot for her. I mean, if you want, my mom can split it with you, and you know, you well, could have read. Your have your mom start reading it because I gotta go open up Maddie. Sure. Okay. Sure. sure. Okay. Hold on. Dennis is getting back in. Oh. All right. He just got back in now. All right. Hey, brother Dennis, you, yeah. you are you able to read uh 20 to 31 of Ezekiel? Yeah, okay. I, I couldn't unmute. Weird. That's it, it didn't it didn't acknowledge me unmuting, so I had to drop out and call again. All right. technology problems. Yeah. All right, brother, whenever you're ready, I'll get it on the screen here. Okay, 28 to 31. Yep. Let's see. <clears throat> and the word of Yahuwah came to me, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Zor, thus said the master Yahuwah, because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am Allah, I sit in the seat of Alaim. In the heat, in, in the heart of the seas, whereas you are a man and not hell, though you set your heart as the heart of Alim. Look, are you wiser than Daniel? Has no secret been hidden from you? By your wisdom and your understanding, you have made riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. But your great wisdom. By your trade, you have increased your riches, and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Master Yahuwah, because you have set your heart as the heart of Elohim. Therefore, see, I am bringing against you strangers, the ruthless ones of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the loveliness of your wisdom, and they shall profane your splendor. Down into the pit they shall bring you, and you shall die the death of the slain in the heart of the seas. Would you still say before him who slays you, I am Alain, whereas you are, you are man and not Allah, in the hand of him who slays you? The death of the uncircumcised you shall die by the hand of foreigners. For I have spoken, declares the Master Yahuwah. And the word of Yahuwah came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the sovereign of Zor, and you shall say to him, Thus said the Master Yahuwah, You were sealing up a pattern complete in wisdom and perfect in loveliness. You were in Edom, the garden of Elohim. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, topaz, and diamond, beryl, shoham, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald, and gold. The workmanship of your settings and mountings was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub that 
covered, and I placed you. You were on, you were on the set apart mountain of Yahuwah. You walked up and down in the midst of stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the greatness of your trade, you became filled with violence within, and you, you sinned. So I thrust you from the mountain of Yahuwah, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because your loveliness, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I threw you to the earth. I, I laid you before sovereigns to look at you. You profaned your set-apart places by your many crookednesses, by the unrighteousness of your trading. Therefore, I brought, fire, I brought forth fire from your midst that has devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth before the eyes of all who see you. All who knew you among the peoples were astonished at you. Waste you shall be and cease to be forever. And the word of Yahuwah came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Zidon, and prophesy against her. And you shall say, Thus said the Master Yahuwah, See, I am against you, O Zion, Zidon, and I shall be esteemed in your midst. And you shall know that I am Yahuwah. When I execute judgments in her, and I shall be set apart in her, and I shall send pestilence upon her, and blood in her streets, and the slain shall fall in her midst by the sword against her from all sides, and they shall know that I am Yahuwah. And there shall no longer be a pricking briar or a painting thorn for the house of Yisrael from among all who are around them who despise them, and they shall know that I am the Master Yahuwah. Thus said the Master Yahuwah, And I have gathered the house of Yisrael from the peoples among whom they are, set, they are scattered. I shall be set apart in them before the eyes of the Gentiles, and they shall dwell in their own land which I give to my servant Jacob. And they shall dwell safely, and build houses, and plant vineyards, and shall safely and dwell safely when I execute judgments on all those around them who despise them. And they shall know that I am Yahuwah their Alain. 29. In the tenth year, in the tenth month, on the twelfth of the month, the word of Yahuwah came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Pharaoh, the sovereign of Mitraim, and prophesy against him and against Mitraim, all of it. Speak, and you shall say, Thus said the Master Yahuwah, See, I am against you, O Pharaoh, sovereign of Mitraim, O great monster, who lies in the midst of his river, who has said, My river is my own, and I, I have made it for myself. And I shall put hooks in, in your jaws, and I shall make the fish of your rivers cling to your scales, and I shall bring you up out of the midst of your rivers, and all the fish in your rivers cling to your scales. And I shall leave you in the wilderness, and you, you and all the fish of your rivers on the face of the field, you shall fall, and you shall not be picked up or gathered. I shall give you as food to the beasts of the field and to the birds of the heavens. And all the inhabitants of Mitzrayim shall know that I am Yahuwah, because they have been a staff of reed to the house of Yisrael. <clears throat> when they grasped you with the hand, you broke and tore all their shoulders. When, you leaned, when they leaned on you, you broke and made all their loins shake. Therefore, thus says the Master Yahuwah, I am bringing a sword upon you, and shall cut off from you man and beast. And the land of Mitzrayim shall become a desert and a waste. And they shall know that I am Yahuwah, because he said, The river is mine, and I have made it. Therefore, see, I am against you, and against your rivers, 
and shall make the land of Mitzrayim an utter waste and a desert, from Migdal to Suina, as far as the border of Cush. No foot of man shall pass through it, nor foot of beast pass through it, neither shall it be inhabited for forty years. And I shall make the land of Mitzrayim a desert in the midst of the lands that are waste, and among the cities that are ruined. Your city shall be a waste forty years, and I shall scatter the Mitzrites among the nations, and I shall disperse them throughout the lands. For thus said the Master Yahuwah, At the end of forty years I shall gather the Mitzrites from the peoples among whom they were scattered, and I shall turn back the captivity of Mitzrayim, and I shall bring them back to the land of Pethros, the land of their birth, and they, there they shall be a lowly reign, being the lowliest of reigns, and never again exalt itself above the nations. And I shall make them few, so as not to rule over the nations. No longer is it to be the refuge of the house of Yisrael, bringing to remembrance their crookedness. When they were turned to follow them, and they shall know that I am the Master Yahuwah. And it came to be in the 27th year, in the first month, on the first of the month, that the word of Yahuwah came to me, saying, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, sovereign of Babel, made his army to serve a great service against Thor. Every head was made bald, and every shoulder worn bare. But he and his army received no reward from Thor for the service he served against it. Therefore, thus says the Master Yahuwah, See, I am giving the land of Mitzrayim to Nebuchadnezzar, sovereign of Babel, and he shall take away her wealth, take her spoil, and remove her pillage, and it shall be a reward for his army. I have given him the land of Mitzrayim as a reward for his labor, because they work for me, declares the Master Yahuwah. And that day I shall make the horn of the house of Israel to spring forth, while I open their mouth to speak in their midst, and they shall know that I am Yahuwah. <clears throat> 30. And the word of Yahuwah came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus said the master Yahuwah, Howl, woe to the day, for the day is near. Even the day of Yahuwah is near. It is a day of clouds, the time of the nations. The sword shall come upon Mitzrayim, and great anguish shall be in Cush. When the slain fall in Mitzrayim, and they shall take away her wealth, and her foundations are broken down. Cush and Put and Lud, all the mixed people, and Cub, and the sons of the land of the covenant, shall fall with them by the sword. Thus said Yahuwah, those who lean on Mitzrayim shall fall, and the pride of her power shall come down. From Migdal to Suina, those within her shall fall by the sword, declares the Master Yahuwah. They shall be burned amidst the wastelands, wastelands, and her cities shall be in the midst of the cities that are dried up. And they shall know that I am Yahuwah. When I have set a fire in Mitzrayim, and all her helpers crushed, from that day messengers shall go forth before me in ships to make placement, make the, make the complacent Cushites afraid, and great anguish shall come upon them as in the day of Mitzrayim. For well, look, it is coming. Thus said Master Yahuwah, I shall cause the cry of Mitzrayim to cease, by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, sovereign of Babel, he and his people with him, the ruthless ones of the nations, are brought to destroy the land, and they shall draw their swords against Mitzrayim, and shall fill the land with the slain. And I shall make the rivers dry, and I shall sell the land into the hand of evil ones, and I shall lay the land waste, and all that is in it, by the hand of foreigners, I, Yahuwah, have spoken. Thus said Master Yahuwah, 
and I shall destroy the idols and make an end of the images of Noth. And there shall no longer be a prince from the land of Mitzrayim, and I shall put fear in the land of Mitzrayim, and I shall make Pathros a waste, and I shall set fire to Zoan, and I shall execute judgments in No, and I shall pour my wrath on sin and the stronghold of Mitzrayim, and I shall cut off the crowd of No, and I shall set a fire in Mitzrayim, then shall write in anguish, No is, in, is to be split open, and Noth his adversaries daily. The young men of Owen and Pythesseth shall fall by the sword, while these cities go into ta- captivity. <clears throat> and in the half mist, the day shall be darkened, when I shatter the yokes of Mithraim there. And the pride of her strength shall cease in her. A cloud shall cover her, and her daughter shall go into captivity. And I shall execute judgments on Mithraim, and they shall know that I am Yahuwah. And it came to be in the eleventh year, in the first month, in the seventh of the month, that the word of Yahuwah came to me, saying, Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, sovereign of Mithraim. And see... It has not been bound up for healing, to put a bondage bandage to bind it, to make it strong, to hold a sword. Therefore, thus says the Master Yahuwah, See, I am against Pharaoh, sovereign of Mitzrayim, and shall break his arms, both the strong one and the one that was broken, and shall make the sword fall out of his hand, and shall scatter the Mitzrites among the nations, and disperse them throughout the lands. And, the, and strengthen the arms of the sovereign of Babel, and I shall put my sword in his hand, and I shall break Pharaoh's arms, and he shall groan before him with the groanings of the slain of the slain before him. And I shall strengthen the arms of the sovereign of Babel, but the arms of Pharaoh shall fall, and they shall know that I am Yahuwah, when I put my sword into the hand of the sovereign of Babel, and he shall stretch it out over the land of Mitzrayim, and I shall scatter the Mitzrites among the nations, and I shall disperse them throughout the lands, and they shall know that I am Yahuwah. 31. And it came to be in the eleventh year, in the third month, on the first of the month, that the word of Yahuwah came to me, saying, Son of man, say to Pharaoh, sovereign of Mitzrayim, and to his crowd, to whom are you to be compared in your greatness? See, Asher was a cedar in, a cedar in Lebanon, fair branches and forest shade, and of high stature, and its top was among the thick foliage. The waters made him great, the deep gave its height, with its rivers running around its planting, and set their channels to the, all the trees of the field. Therefore, his height was lifted up above all the trees of the field, and its bows were increased, and its branches became long before because of the many waters as it sent them back. All the birds of the Shemaim made their nest in its bows, and under its branches all the beasts of the field gave birth, and in its shadow all great nations dwelt. And it was fair and gent- in greatness, and in the length of its branches, where its roots reached the many waters. Cedars in the garden of Aleim did not hide it. Fir trees were not like its bows, and the chestnut trees were not like its branches. No tree in the garden of Yahuwah was as pretty as it. I made it pretty by its many branches, so that all the trees of Eden which were in the garden of Alim were jealous of it. Therefore, thus said the Master Yahuwah, because you have increased in height, and it set its top amongst the thick foliage, and its heart was lifted up in its height, I give it into the land of the mighty one of the nations, and he shall certainly deal with it. I have driven it out of its wrong. As foreigners, the most ruthless of the nations, shall cut it down and leave it. 
His branches shall fall on the mountains and all in all the valleys, as those lie broken by all the rivers of the land. And all the peoples of the earth shall fight, shall come out from under its shadow and leave it. On its wern shall dwell at all the birds of the Shemaim, and all the beasts of the field shall be on its fallen branches, so that none of the trees by the waters would exalt themselves because of their height, nor set their tops among the thick foliage, <coughs> and that no tree which drinks water would ever be high enough to reach up to them, for all of them shall be given up to death to the depths of the earth among the children of men who go down to the pit. Thus said the Master Yahuwah, In the day when it is brought down to the grave, I shall cause mourning. <coughs> I shall cover the deep because of it and hold back its stream, and many waters shall be con- confined, and I shall make Lebanon mourn for it. And all the trees of the field shall wither away because of it. I shall make the nation shake at the sound of its fall. When I bring it down to the grave, together with those who descend into the pit. <clears throat> and all the trees of Eden, the choice the, and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be con- comforted in the depth of the earth. They too shall go down to the grave with it, with those slain by the sword, and those who were its strength shall dwell in its shadows among the nations. To whom are you to be compared in esteem and greatness among the trees in Eden? But you shall be brought down with the trees of Eden to the depths of the earth, lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with those slain by the sword. This is Pharaoh and all his crowd, declares the Master Yahuwah. I understand even today, Mithraim, or Egypt, hasn't gotten over the uh, Exodus. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty little. I mean, they're uh, a lot different today. I think, actually, if I remember correctly, there's a lot more Christians, actually, in that country now. There's um, It's a lot more, a, a lot different today than it was back then. Back yeah. then, it, it was it was more pagan back then. It yeah. was more polytheistic back then. Um, today, there's a lot of Coptics uh-huh. in that country. Yeah. They've even moved over here. Um, my mom had a friend yeah. that yeah, that, she's, she's that was a, a Coptic Egyptian, a Coptic Egyptian Christian. And, and I was uh, amazed at her faith. Yeah. I had a very long talk with her one day, and uh, yeah. I was amazed at, at, at her faith. Um, very, very uh, deep faith in uh, in the Savior and in and yeah. His Father. They, uh, yeah, so it's kind of interesting. They, they've they always gone through, you can even follow all the dynasties of Egypt, even back to the time of the flood or ab- right after the flood. They've had so many different changes from from one king to another they go from monotheism polytheism back and forth it's like a seesaw and uh king tut historically was the guy that uh pretty much brought the religion of the old gods quote unquote back to egypt and uh polytheism back and uh possibly could have been the pharaoh of the exodus some people believe utmost king tut uh so the uh yeah but um yeah, Egypt is pretty small as far as power too among the nations. They're pretty, they're not really mentioned much. You don't really hear much about Egypt in this day and age. And uh, yeah, so I wanted to go to the one, the chapter you just finished with. And uh, from I actually have from memory a lot of stuff I want to cover with Ezekiel 31 because this is an interesting chapter. This is... This goes to um, this goes to a prophecy about the Assyrian and you who is comparing this Pharaoh and kind of like pushing him down to size. He's kind of bringing him back down to earth. Like 
you ain't really that hot, man. I had this guy called the Assyrian, man. He's uh, he he was a lot stronger than you, taller than you, esteemed more than you, uh, you know. And then it gets to the point where he starts talking about how the Assyrian rebelled against him and that he's going to be sent down to the sides of the pit, um, which kind of reminds me of Isaiah chapter 14 in a, in a way. Um, so the Assyrian, and I'll, I'm just going to put it out there. I believe the Assyrian is a prophetic name of, of the beast. I believe it's a prophetic title of the beast. Um, oh yeah, we're going to get to the tree symbology and what I think that means. Um, I, we, we did a study a while ago. I would recommend people search on the channels called, um, a non-Egyptian pharaoh question mark who is the Assyrian um, where I try to connect the dots and I believe the Assyrian is a title for Nimrod the beast of revelations okay I believe this is prophetically talking about Nimrod's life as he was alive on earth and how he was first esteemed he was as tall as the trees cedars of Eden you know again which refers to him being you know a giant okay um, I, I think that's literal. I think that's literally it's 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 an allegory, but it's referring to a cedar as in stature of a person. And I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about with Brother Dennis just read here. It says such cypresses as this were in the paradise of Ali I'm talking about the Garden of Eden. There were no pines like his shoots. And there were no firs like his branches branches would be his arms. No tree in the paradise of Ali was like him in his beauty. Now, you know, and we're going to get there. I'm going to go to Genesis 10 to show you guys what I'm talking about in Septuagint. Because the multitude of his branches and the trees of Elohim's paradise of delight envied him. Therefore, thus says Yahuwah, because you are grown great and have set your top in the midst of the clouds. I saw when he was exalted. Therefore, I delivered him into the hands of the prince of nations. And to me, this kind of, <laughs> it's almost like a messianic title, which is kind of interesting. And, and, you know, the theory goes is that supposedly um, there's either two theories you can have about Nimrod's death. It's either Abraham, which Genesis 14 hints to, or which would actually make sense, a prince of nations. What does Yahuwah talk about with Abraham that, you know, many nations will be brute by you, right? Through you, many nations will be brute. So a prince, you know, a leader, um, you know prince as in like chief and authority you know you who is basically making abraham you know his guy where the seed of messiah is going to come from okay so to me it would make sense he's referring to abraham that's the one that you who had delivered him to rather than the uh rabbinical tradition that esau killed him it just doesn't make sense to me it would place abraham's death way too late number one um because uh, because Esau is way after Abraham. So that means you have Nimrod, a wicked person, mind you, living a couple hundred years after the flood. I, I don't know. Just doesn't add up to me. Doesn't, doesn't add up what Jasher talks about. So um, I, I believe Genesis 14 gives us the answer. You can find that um, um, where he kills Amraphel, King of Shinar which I believe to be Nimrod, and so do one of the Targums claims that he's uh, Amraphel, King of Shinar. Okay, so so when when uh, chapter so chapter 31, verse 11 says that he was delivered to the prince of nations, and ravaging strangers from the nations have destroyed him. Remember the legend about Abraham's missing part? Okay, not Abraham's, Nimrod's missing part. That was, you know, chopped up in million pieces, okay, uh, and have cast him upon the mountains, and his branches fell in all the valleys, and his bows were broken in every field of the land, and all the people and nations are gone down from their shelter and have laid him low. All the birds of the sky have settled on his fallen trunk, um, and all the wild beasts of the field came upon his bows. To me, this reminds me of Nebuchadnezzar, too, the vision of Nebuchadnezzar, how Nebuchadnezzar um, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is likened to a tree. Yeah. So this is kind of like the same I thing. I was thinking about that too. In order that none of the trees by the water should exalt themselves by reason of their size, whereas they 
set their top in the midst of the clouds. Okay, and all that drink the water, yada, yada, yada. So, and he even says, in the day wherein he went past <laughs> heads down to Hades. This gives us a clue it can't be talking about Nebuchadnezzar. This is talking about Nimrod because it's in past tense saying he went down to Hades, to the grave, to Sheol, to the pit. The deep mourned for him. <laughs> Ooh, we could go to some crazy conspiracy theories on who in the deep were mourning for him. Oh boy, we could we could go for some uh, weird theories about that. Uh, the fact that Job talks about can giants be born in the in in water? Can <laughs> so I don't know, man. Very very weird there that the deep, meaning the waters of the deep, mourned for him. Interesting, interesting, and restrained her abundance of water. Lebanon saddened for him. All the trees of the field fainted for him. Uh, yeah, go ahead, brother Joshua. So on your point of Amraphel being um, possibly being Nimrod, um, so on Wikipedia uh, on that topic, um, they, they have a rabbinic tradition, um, mm -hmm. and uh, it says in rabbinic tradition, um, Targum Yonatan to Exodus 14.1 and Eruvin 53a identify Amraphel with Nimrod. Yep. Yep. So, so uh, in their tradition, yeah, because they're, they're uh, quote unquote, traditional Judean rabbinical history. They liken him also to Hammurabi, too. If you look on JewishEncyclopedia.com, it has a whole article about that and what you just mentioned about the rabbinical tradition of Amraphel. So many historians have confirmed that just through the timeline of Genesis 10 to 14. Um, there wouldn't have been that much time for Nimrod to die. I mean, Nimrod was still a young guy, supposedly, uh, after the Tower of Babel. So, I mean, he, the legend of him being split into a million pieces and all that, that wouldn't have been until after Genesis 14, in my opinion. So, to me, it fits perfectly. Like, even we just, even if we put rabbinical tradition to the side and just, you know, look at the canon, we, we have a short time span between Genesis 10 and 11 and chapter 14. It's not that much of a gap. So um, so those that believe that there was another king that rose up that was Amraphel separate from Nimrod, I don't know. It, to me, chronologically, that doesn't make sense. Um, there, There's a very short time period. The only way you have a problem is if you take what Jasher says about Esau killing him. Then it messes it up. Because <laughs> then you have him living way, way, way too far um way too far so that's where they mess up with the rabbinic stuff they start going with the whole esau killed him thing rather than abraham in genesis 14 which literally genesis 14 says abraham killed the kings that were there so literally tells you that so but great point brother joshua i i i definitely agree with that portion of that rabbin uh, of that judean traditional history you could say I would agree that they are onto something about Amraphel and uh, and Hammurabi is another name they had for him traditionally. Um, so anyway, um, going back though to this description here, it talks about him going down to Sheol, going down to hell. He went down to hell already. Um, it says with him among the slain with the sword and his seed. Interesting. They that dwelt under his shadow perished in the midst of their life. Interesting. Whom are you compared? Descend and be debased with the trees of paradise to the depth of the earth. You know, all the way down to the pit. You shall lie in the midst of the uncircumcised. Doesn't Isaiah say the same thing? Isaiah 14 say the same thing. You shall lie in the midst of the uncircumcised. Or you shall die the death of the uncircumcised with them that are slain by the sword. Thus says, oh my, my bad. Thus shall Pharaoh be in the multitude of his army, says Yehu Elohim. So this Pharaoh, man, who is comparing him to Satan in this chapter? Not in this chapter, but in chapter 29, he's comparing him now to Nimrod. Whew. 
this guy, man, this guy must have been some evil, evil king, man. He must have been like the Pharaoh of Exodus for you. Who would have do that? He's comparing him to one of the worst tyrants ever to live. So this, wow. All right, so anyway, that's Ezekiel 31 about the Assyrian. Okay, pretty much we uh, don't want to beat a dead horse with that, but that's my theory on who this is referring to as the Assyrian. Um, if you're interested in that topic, look for the video. Uh, a non-Egyptian pharaoh question mark who is the Assyrian. Um, so, and so you can dive more deeply into that. But before actually we get to the prior chapters, and um, I want to also show you guys the assertion I made from Genesis 10. Okay, if you look at the Septuagint, they use a Greek equivalent to the word geberim. And I really think this is a translation issue with the King James and other translations. The majority of translators, when it comes to the Hebrew word geberim, they never want to translate it as giant for whatever reason. They never want to do it. They always put mighty one or a mighty man. But if you actually look at the definition of even the Masoretic Hebrew text of that word for mighty one, it can mean giant depending on the context. Okay. So it said, Cush begot Nimrod, he began to be a giant upon the earth. Okay. So somehow he went from being a normal human and became a hybrid giant, which, uh, you know, we were uh, studying off the record uh, Sabbath evening about some possibilities that other historical research points to that uh, there could be some forbidden knowledge from the pre-flood Genesis 6 time, lock, time period that, you know, Nimrod could have came across some written literature to, to do that. But anyway, that's that's conjecture. Really don't know how he became a giant. Really don't know. The point of the matter is he became one. So um, anyway, and it also says here, he began to be a giant and he was a giant hunter. So he hunted giants before Yahuwah Elohim. Therefore they say it as Nimrod, the giant hunter. So he hunted other hybrid giants. Okay. And by the way, the word before is misleading in the English. Okay. It's not supposed to be before. It's actually against Yahuwah. And uh, you can find that in the Targums. The Targums actually say mighty in sin, mighty, mighty in rebellion for that Hebrew word, the Aramaic equivalent. So this is more of modern translators mistranslating the word and translating it as before instead of against. Okay, so just wanted to explain that. Um, but, and I'll show you how the Septuagint's write that it became a hunter of giants. If you go to Genesis 14 real quick. I'm going to show you something. Um, let's see here. 12 years. Do, 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 having turned back came. Okay. 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 Sea of salt. One of them that had been rescued. Okay. Became asylum. All right. Where does it start? Okay. The region. Amrfeld, King of Shinar. Okay, area, king of Alizar, title, king of nations. And they made war, and Bala, Saddam, and Barsa with the king, and with Senar, king of Adama, and Segamor, the king of Zobim, and, and the king of Balak, this is Zagor. All these met with one consent at the Salt Sea. Interesting, one consent, one mind. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, 12 years they served Chudal Omar in the 13th year they rebelled. In the 14th year came Chudal Omar and the kings with him and cut to pieces the who? Giants in Ashtaroth. So the Septuagint can be proven later on in Genesis 14 and both the Masoretic and Septuagint <laughs> say they killed giants or they killed the Rephaim. Rephaim is a tribe of giants. Okay, so that's why the Hebrew says at Raphaim. Okay, and the uh, the root word is Rafa, and that's the demons, but we've already covered that on other studies. Okay, okay, so anyway, so we're going to move on here. We're going to go back to chapter 30. There's a couple of verses I wanted to get to in chapter 30 of Ezekiel. So anyway, uh, all right. 
Ezekiel 30. All right. <clears throat> Son of man. And obviously, we see the Adonai here. Master, the master before you who is name. Or it might say the sovereign in, in your English, regular English translations. Okay. Um, Septuagint says, thus says Yahuwah. Okay. Uh, verse 5 is very interesting in chapter 30. Okay. Cretans. The Masoretic text is lacking the, the, the word Cretans here. And Cretans, just to explain, the island of Crete was a Greek island. It was of Greece. So today the Greeks back then would have been known as the Cretans. Okay, the, the island of Crete, okay? And it's historically, that's where you get the Greek religion of, 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 of Mount Olympus and the gods and all that. That actually originated that mythology or religion, according to them, their real history originated in Crete, according to certain philosophers and the Greek philosophers that write in their own books. Supposedly, the Isles of Crete is where all their mythology goes back. So, anyway, thought I would mention that. Um, all right. So, a horn shall spring out of, of Yasharal. So, let's go to Ezekiel 29 here. Ezekiel 29. To me, this sounds like a, a prophecy of his first coming or a possible future second coming that we're still waiting on it says in that day shall a horn sometimes when you see horn in prophecy it's referring to a king so it's actually saying in that day shall a king spring forth for all the house of yashrael that means the two houses and i will give you no mouth in the midst of them and they shall know that i am yahuwah now to me this probably is future rather than his first coming um, this this kind of gives the idea that the whole house of Yashorel will be united under one king. You know, sometimes in prophecy, you'll see Yahusha referred to as their King David. They shall have one King David. Okay. So now we're going to go to verse 20 here of chapter 29. In return for his service. So here we go. We have... Right at the end of the verse, we have Adonai again before Yahuwah's name. The Septuagint just has Yahuwah Elohim. Okay. We've got two more cross references here for chapter 29. Okay. What I found interesting is verse 17. It came to pass in the 27th year and the first of the month, the word of Yahuwah came to me saying, So, the Septuagint, for some reason, doesn't mention it's the first month, the exact month that this is happening. It will say on the first of the month, but it won't say in the first month on the first. Oh, no, my bad. In Yeah, it won't say in the first month for whatever reason. It just says in the 25th year on the first of the month. So it doesn't tell you which month of the year it is. So that's that's just something I wanted to mention. The Septuagint seems to lack uh, the word that is in the Masoretic for the first month. So, okay. Um, jumping back down to verse 19. Okay, again, we see the Adonai being added here. The master, wherever the master is in the ISR, that's the Hebrew word Adonai. That's the Masoretic Hebrew Adonai. Okay, in the Septuagint, has Kurios Theos, which would be Yahuwah Aliim. Okay. All right. That's it for chapter 29. Let's go to 28. Woo! We got a lot from this chapter. A lot of differences. Huge doctrinal differences here. Oh boy. Oh boy. We're going to ruffle some feathers with this. And we're going to be breaking tradition here. All right. Verse two, we have another Adonai. And let's let's just go to the east or back to the east or because some people that just joined will be like, how do you know that the master is Adonai? I'm, I'm going to show you guys. Okay, show you show you real quick in the parallel here. Okay, 
There you go, right here. Thus says Yahuwah. This is what it says in the Septuagint of verse 2. Okay. Verse 12 of this chapter. So we're going to jump down to verse 12. Septuagint says, Thus says Yahuwah Elohim, Masoretic from the Sefer has Adonai then Yahuwah. So Adonai is being added there in front of the Tetragrammaton. Okay, verse 13. I find this interesting. When Dennis was reading, I was like, whoa, this is different. Instead of, instead of it saying gold was part of his breastplate, when he was created and that gold was on him, it says he filled his storehouses with gold. So it's more like Satan stealing or he's extortioning. And you have filled your treasuries and your storehouses in you with gold. I find that interesting. So Yahuwah didn't give him gold. He took it for himself whole different paradigm there verse 16 huge difference here it calls him the covering cherub which by nowhere else in scripture does satan ever is satan ever called a cherub or the covering cherub um nowhere else in scripture nowhere in the new testament nowhere in the torah nowhere in other prophets there's no second witness to this but the Septuagint seems to fix that problem. It says, um, let's just read it here, the whole phrase here. It says, therefore you have been casted down, thrown out of heaven, wounded from the Mount of Elohim, and the cherub has brought you out of the midst of the stones of fire. So he's not the cherub. Michael is the cherub and michael kicked him out of the mountain of Elohim. that's what it's saying so that fixes the contradiction problem there because no other source can we find that says satan was a cherub and uh i personally believe he's a seraphim we're going to do a study on that sometime in the future yahuwah willing um, i got multiple witnesses for this even an extra biblical witness that adds to uh, adds another witness to the Septuagint that he was a seraphim, a seraphine and not a cherub. Uh, okay, so all right, so let's see here. Okay, right here, verse twenty five. The Masoretic adds Adonai. Septuagint would say, thus says Yahuwah Elohim. The Masoretic says, thus says Adonai Yahuwah. Okay. Now we're going to go to chapter 29, verse 1. This is a huge, big problem here that you will get with the, chronolo um, the chronological order of, of the scriptures in the Masoretic text. The Masoretic is saying that this happened in the 10th year. Now, in the Septuagint, it says it happened in the 12th year. So you have two years off prophetically in, in, in a timeline. And even in a, in a captivity timeline, you have a two-year difference between the two manuscripts. That's a big problem. Um, so, all right, verse 3. And just to add to uh, Brother Joshua's point about before that it would make more sense when we read about the dragon verse earlier in Ezekiel that Yahuwah is going to use the dragon to punish his people Israel, punish his people Yasharal, and that it would make more sense that it's referring to Satan than, than the creature Leviathan. Uh, this adds to Brother Joshua's point here, okay, in uh, 29 verse 3. Okay, Yahuwah is pointing to Pharaoh, and he's saying, thus says Yahuwah, and of course, again, they got the stupid Adonai crud there added in front of it. Thus says Yahuwah, behold, I am against Pharaoh, the great 
dragon that lies in the midst of the rivers and says, the rivers are mine and I made them. Who does that sound like? I will, I will ascend above the stars of Elohim. I will be like the most high. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is obviously talking about the great dragon, which by the way, in Revelations 12, that phrase, the great dragon is used for Satan, by the way. So that title mm -hmm. itself refers to Satan. Um, verse eight, again, we have the Adonai problem. Okay, so the Septuagint would read as, thus, therefore, thus says Yahuwah. In the Masoretic, they add the word Adonai in front of his name, so it would say, thus says Adonai Yahuwah. Okay, verse 13 also. Thus says Yahuwah. And then you have the Adonai for the Masoretic. Okay. And I think we already covered verse 16. Yeah. Okay, let me just make sure you had... No, I don't think we did, actually. They shall no more be to the house of Yasharal a confidence, bringing lawlessness to remembrance when they follow after them, and they shall know that I am Yahuwah. And the Masoretic here adds Adonai in front of Yahuwah. Okay. All right. That is the end of the Ezekiel portion. I believe the next reader or next readers. Okay, so let's see here. Um, okay, so let's see here. I believe we got Sister Sadia and Sister Marissa. They will be sharing the Proverbs portion, the wisdom portion. So we'll be doing a new recording soon. So we're going to do a, a wisdom portion and uh, actually, you know what? I'll take that back. We can, we can keep it on this same recording because it's only going to be three chapters. All right. So um, sister Marissa and sister Sadia, if you guys are ready, um, if you can read Proverbs 28 to 31. Not according to your evil ways and your corrupt practices. Whoop. Whoop. My bad. That was a previous recording there. All right, Sister Sadia, Sister Marissa, are you are you guys able to read? I'm not able, brother. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. I'll read it. Sister. You sure, Mom? Yeah. All right. Of course. Yeah. All right. Um. Okay. Twenty-eight. Yeah, 28 to 31, yep. Okay. The wicked man flees, though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. When a country is rebellious, it has many rulers, but a man of understanding and knowledge maintains order. A ruler, or, or I have a footnote that says a poor man, interesting, um, who oppresses the poor is like a driving rain that leaves no crops. Those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law resist them. Evil men do not understand justice, 
but those who seek Yahuwah understand it fully. Better a poor man whose walk is blameless than a rich man whose ways are perverse. He who keeps the law is a discerning son, but a companion of gluttons disgraces his father. He who increases his wealth by exorbitant interest amasses it for another who will be kind to the poor. If anyone turns a deaf ear to the law, even his prayers are detestable. He who leads the upright along an evil path will fall into his own trap but the blameless will receive a good inheritance. A rich man may be wise in his own eyes, but a poor man who has discernment sees through him. When the righteous triumph, there is great elation, but when the wicked rise to power, men go into hiding. He who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Blessed is the man who always fears Yahuwah, but he who hardens his heart falls into trouble. Like a roaring lion or a charging bear is a wicked man ruling over a helpless people. A tyrannical ruler lacks judgment, but he who hates ill-gotten gain will enjoy a long life. A man tormented by the guilt of murder will be a fugitive till death. Let no one support him. He whose walk is blameless is kept safe, but he whose ways are perverse will suddenly fall. He whose works his land, he who works his land will have abundant food, but the one who chases fantasies will have his fill of poverty. A faithful man will be richly blessed, but one eager to get rich will not go unpunished. To show partiality is not good, yet a man will do wrong for a fierce, for a piece of bread, a piece, excuse me, for a piece of bread. A stingy man is eager to get rich and is unaware that poverty awaits him. He who rebukes a man will in the end gain more favor than he who has a flattering tongue. He who robs his father or mother and says, it's not wrong. He is partner to him who destroys. A greedy man stirs up dissension, but he who trusts in Yahuwah will prosper. He who trusts in himself is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom is kept safe. He who gives to the poor will lack nothing, but he who closes his eyes to them receives many curses. When the wicked rise to power, People go into hiding, but when the wicked perish, the righteous thrive. Chapter 29. <clears throat> a man who remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. When the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. A man who loves wisdom brings joy to his father, but a companion of prostitutes squanders his wealth. By justice, a king gives a country stability, but one who is greedy for bribes tears it down. Whoever flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his feet. An evil man is snared by his own sin, but a righteous one can sing and be glad. The righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. Mockers stir up a city, but wise men turn away anger. If a wise man goes to court with a fool, the fool rages and scoffs, and there is no peace. Bloodthirsty men hate a man of integrity and seek to kill the upright. A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. If a ruler listens to lies, all his officials become wicked. The poor man and the oppressor have this in common. Yahuwah gives sight to the eyes of both. If a king judges the poor with fairness, his throne will always be secure. The rod of correction imparts wisdom, but a child left to itself disgraces his mother. When the wicked thrive, so does sin, but the righteous will see their downfall. Discipline your son, and he will give you peace. 
He will bring delight to your soul. When there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. A servant cannot be corrected by mere words. Though he understands, he will not respond. Do you see a man who speaks in haste? There is more hope for a fool than for him. If a man pampers his servant from youth, he will bring grief in the end. An angry man stirs up dissension, and a hot-tempered one commits many sins. A man's pride brings him low, but a man of lowly spirit gains honor. The accomplice of a thief is his own enemy. He is put under oath and dare not testify. Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in Yahuwah is kept safe. Many seek an audience with a ruler, but it is from Yahuwah that man gets justice. The righteous detest the dishonest, the wicked detest the upright. Chapter 30. <clears throat> the sayings of Agur, son of Jacke, an oracle. This man declared to Ithiel, to Ithiel and to Yukal, I am the most ignorant of men. I do not have a man's understanding. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the, of the set apart one. Who has gone up to heaven and come down? Who has gathered up the wind in the hollow of his hands? Who has wrapped up the waters in his cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? and the name of his son. Tell me if you know. Every word of Yahuwah is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, for he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. Two things I ask of you, O Yahuwah. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is Yahuwah? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my Elohim. Not slander a servant to his master or he will curse you and you will pay for it. Those, there are those who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers. Those who are pure in their own eyes and yet are not cleansed of their filth. Those whose eyes are ever so haughty, whose glances are so disdainful. Those whose teeth are swords and whose jaws are set with knives to devour the poor from the earth, the needy from among mankind. The leech has two daughters, give Give, they cry. The, there are three things that are never satisfied, four that never say enough. The grave, the barren womb, land, which is never satisfied with water, and fire, which never says enough. <clears throat> the eye that mocks a father, that scorns obedience to a mother, will be pecked up by the ravens of the valley will be eaten by the vultures. There are three things that are too amazing for me, four that I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a maiden. This is the way of an adulteress. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. Under three things the earth trembles. Under four it cannot bear up. A servant who becomes king, a fool is, who is full of, of food. An unloved woman who is married, and a maid servant who displaces her mistress. Dis, yeah, displaces, okay. Four things on earth are small, yet they are extremely wise. Ants are creatures of little strength, Yet they store up their food in the summer. Conies, or it says a, a rock badger, okay. um, are creatures of little power, yet they make their homes in the crags. 
locusts have no king, yet they advance together in ranks. A lizard can be caught with the hand, yet it is founded in king's palaces. There are three things that are stately in their stride, four that move with stately bearing. A lion, <clears throat> mighty among beasts, who retreats before nothing, a strutting rooster, a he goat, and a king with his army around him. If you have played the fool and exalted yourself, or if you have planned evil, clap your hand over your mouth. For as churning the milk produces butter, and as twisting the nose produces blood, so stirring up anger produces strife. Okay, chapter 31. The sayings of King Lemuel, an oracle his mother taught him. O my son, O son of my womb, O son of my vows, do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, not for kings to drink wine, not for rulers to crave beer, lest they drink and forget what the law decrees and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Give beer to those who are perishing, wine to those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Okay, and this is a very famous chapter about a good wife. A wife of noble character who can find. She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She bakes him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She, she selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still dark. She provides food for her family. I'm sorry, <laughs> this chapter reminds me of my mom and that's why I'm losing it. I'll get it in a second, just give me a second. She, okay, <clears throat> she provides food for her family and portions for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. <clears throat> In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithfulness. Instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears Yahuwah is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Good light in your life. That's a good one to bring up. And <clears throat> chapter 29 alone has a lot of good wisdom. <clears throat> a lot of good wisdom we can apply. Uh, so 
There's a strife. A passionate man digs up sin. Pride brings a man low, but you who upholds the humble minded with honor. Okay, let's see what we got. Uh, I like the one that says, if anyone turns a deaf ear to the law, even his prayers are detestable. Mm -hmm. okay. The right text is missing half. Oh. Half. Uh, first. Okay. All right. So let's just see here. Go ahead, Brother Joshua. Um, is it possible that this is like shadowing um, the, that the woman that it's talking about is shadowing um, the the church or the body? Uh, um, <laughs> The bride. Um, yeah. I asked because it talks about um, in verse 29, it says, Many daughters have obtained wealth, many have wrought valiantly, but you have you have exceeded, you have surpassed all. Yeah, it's very possible. Um, Yahuwah, a lot of times, will use that. Um, he'll use that, uh, uh, the phrase woman or yeah, he'll reasonable. use a woman to represent the bride or the body of Messiah. Um, mm -hmm. Or it could be both. You know, it could be like a double meaning, which could mean, yeah, this is what, a, 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 you know, a yeah, woman that, of Yahuwah yeah. should be. Um, mm -hmm. I agree. It, it's kind of like a double meaning type of I thing. So. Uh, let's see here. Chapter 30, verse 5 is interesting that the Masoretic says, to those that take refuge in him, he's a shield to those <clears> that <throat> take refuge in him. Septuagint says he defends those that reverence him. So a little bit stronger with uh, the obedience factor there. Okay. Do not add to his words. Verse 6, lest he refuse you, reprove you, you be found a liar. And that was part of our study last night. That was one of the cross references we did. Okay. I should say verse 8 in chapter 30 is from my heart. Let me tell you. Now, I think Paul at some point in time has quoted from chapter 30. Because I'm noticing what it says. Um, Remove far from me many. Paul said, give me not wealth and poverty, but appoint me that which is needful and sufficient. Right. Could have swore I've seen that in other places in scripture. Yeah. Unless I be filled and become false and say, Who's me? or be poor and steal and swear by yeah. the name of Allahim. So that seems to be something Paul talks about, or he references that I know how to be poor and I know yeah, how to abound. Right. So it's a similar concept. Um, the other. Deliver not a servant into the hands of his master, unless he curse you, and you be utterly destroyed. So that, in context, that's talking about a master mishandling his slave. A wicked generation curse their father and do not barack their mother, uh, which we see later on in the book of Timothy, when Paul's writing to Timothy, he's saying in, in you know, <clears throat> there, in those days, Children will be hateful to parents and all that. So a wicked generation judges themselves to be righteous, do not cleanse, but do not cleanse their way. Um, okay. Same thing with verse 13 there. They exalt themselves in their own eyes. Wicked generation have swords, teeth, and jaw teeth as knives, <clears throat> so as to destroy and devour the lowly from the earth, the humble from the earth poor of them from among men. So it's talking about devouring the poor. The horse leech had three dearly beloved daughters. These three could not satisfy her. The fourth was not contended so as to stay enough. So it's basically saying that um, uh, King Solomon's using a, uh, a allegory here, basically saying that many are not satisfied. They get all the abundance they want and they still want more. 
and that and that's what verse 16 and 17 is about see the grave she old and the love of a woman meaning you know intercourse most likely in context and earth not filled with water talking about the waters of the deep water also and fire will not say it is enough the eye that laughs to scorn a father now this is bad uh, and dishonors the old age of a mother mother let the ravens of the valleys pick it out and let the young eagles devour it. Okay. Moreover, there are things, there are three things possible for me to comprehend and four if I know. The track of a flying eagle, and he goes on to the ways of the young man is used, such way as an adulterous woman, who has washed herself from what she has done, says she has done nothing amiss. Basically, no conscience. That's what yeah. he's trying to say. By three things, the earth is troubled, for it cannot bear a servant that reigns over a master, okay, or a fool being filled with food. Or if a maid servant should cast out her own mistress. And a hateful woman should marry a good man for very little things upon the earth, but these are wiser than me, wiser than the wise. The ants which are weak prepare food in summer, and yada, yada, yada. So it goes through the whole list of animals here that they prepare and they're not lazy. That's the point of what he's trying to make there. A lion's whelp stronger than all beasts, which turns not away nor fears any beast. The cock walking in boldly among the hens and, and the goat leading the herd and a king publicly speaking before a nation. So, all right, now we're gonna go, I just wanna touch on 31 on some of the differences here, especially the last verse. I find it interesting in verse 31, the verse that says a woman shall be praised. Um, let me show you the difference here with the Septuagint says charms are false verse 30 here and a woman's beauty is vain for it is a wise woman that is brute and let her praise the fear of yahuwah huge different context there rather than she should be praised mm -hmm. huge different context oh yeah um so the mazerites changed let her praise the fear of yahuwah to yahuwah she shall be praised Okay, um, give her the fruit of her lips and let her husband be praised in the gates. Ooh, oh boy. We're stepping on some, we're stepping on some feminism here. Ooh, uh, the Mazerites sound a little feminist here. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her. The Septuagint says, give her the fruit of her lips and let her husband be praised in the gates. We're stepping on feminism here. Oh boy, we, we, yeah. this study might get blocked on YouTube. Well, oh you know, boy, this editing happened somewhere between the late seventies and the early eighties, right in the in the cusp of women's lib. So I don't doubt. You know what's funny too. You know what's funny too is that these these Mazerites are of the same belief system that created the myth of Lilith and Lilith you could say is the first ever feminist yeah. if you actually know the Jewish myth of Lilith and it is a myth there's nowhere nowhere in the original scriptures is she mentioned uh, matter of fact the word Lilith is only in the Masoretic text in in um, Isaiah and I think like I one isolated verse in Isaiah talking about um, end times Babylon that Lilith mm -hmm. shall roam about. It's talking about like female demons, basically. Uh, <laughs> literally, in context, it's talking about Lilith as a female demon. So the, the Mazerites are probably the same type of Kabbalistic scribes that ascribe to the Jewish rabbinical myth of Lilith. And, you know, they probably esteemed women that uh, higher than they should be. And that's probably why Yahushua had to make a point in front of the Pharisees and all them and all the women saying, you know, because the woman says to him, oh, Baruch are those paps that you have yeah, sucked. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he's like, oh, um, no, it's actually, it's Baruch are those that hear my father's word yeah. and do it. 
So, you know, uh, yeah, it's very interesting how the Masoretic in certain aspects is pro-feminism in a way and and how 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 the Septuagint is completely different. It's it's showing that women have a place. Um, It shows that her husband should be praised, not her. Um, that that's a completely different concept that that <laughs> that's actually a biblical concept that the she has her place the husband is the head okay <laughs> so this 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 is something we've lost concept of um, with all this uh, me too movement uh, left-wing nonsense um, we de- see a few instances where Yahusha squelches that whole Mary thing yeah and I'm quite yeah. sure the Catholic Church just glides. Oh yeah, they don't right read that it. verse. They don't know. You know, no. they they don't spend any time no. on when she comes with the kids, and they say, "Your mother and your sister and your brothers are outside. Who are my mother and my brothers yeah. or sisters? My mother and my brothers and sisters are those who obey my Father in heaven." You know, I mean, he is several times this comes about. You know, the wedding at Cana. He puts her in her place right there. You know, um, these are several instances in the Gospels. It's interesting. The Catholic Church just doesn't spend a lot of time on. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, let's go back. Let's see. I think we addressed chapter 30, chapter 31. Let's go to 29 here. There's a lot in 29 that I wrote down, okay? Verse 25 is missing half of the verse in the Masoretic here, mm-hmm. okay? Um mm-hmm. Chapter 29, 25. So let's go previous chapter. So one th- good thing I like about the word program, there's a, a tab you can click to go previous chapter. All right, so let's see here. 29, 25, okay. What chapter would that be in the Septuagint? Would it be? That, it would be 29. Yeah, okay. Proverbs is pretty much equal in both versions as far as the numbering of the chapters. Um, the only thing it gets to gets to be weird at the end is our Septuagints that we have lack chapter 30. Chapter 30 is just not there. It's just not there. I've noticed it. It's not there. It jumps from 29 to 31. So I don't know if the, if the sweets, the manuscript of the sweet Septuagint uh, that the Lexham people used, I guess there's, there's uh, you know, uh, that chapter was missing or fragmented or something um where they weren't able to put it in their translation where i guess they were it wasn't available or something uh but anyway because the bretons have it so just to explain there's like multiple families of the septuagint manuscript family certain manuscripts have certain chapters others don't so um anyway because we're pretty much working, working with, even the manuscripts we have today are not the original manuscripts. They're a copy of a copy. So um, like, like Breton is actually, the Breton Septuagint uses the Codex Vaticanus, which is the Latin translation of the Greek Septuagint. So, all right. So Proverbs 29, 25, the Masoretic is missing here. Um, let's see, whoever trusts in you who is set on high. Okay, so this part is missing from the Masoretic. Wickedness causes a man to stumble, but he that trusts in his master shall be saved. All right, let's go to 29, verse 22. A furious man stirs up strife, and a passionate man digs up sin. A passionate man digs up sin. Okay, now. All right. 29 verse 17 uh, okay chasten your son and he shall give you rest and he shall honor shall give honor to your soul okay self-explanatory there all right let's go to verse 11 here A fool utters all his mind, but the wise reverses, reserves in his part. So this is basically showing that sometimes we just need to keep our mouth shut. Yep. That's a lesson for me, preaching to the choir here. All right. You're talking about me, brother, again. I don't like that. 
good. That's not good. Uh, my mouth gets me into trouble, so I know I know how that feels. Hey, I'm hated around the world, so it's okay. Lawless men burn down a city, but wise men turn away wrath. Let's see here. Verse 8. That was that. We just read 8. All right. Let's see here. Verse 6. A great snare is spread for a sinner, but the righteous shall be in joy and gladness. Yep. Verse 5. All right. He that prepares in the net of the way in the way of his own friend entangles his own feet in it. And it's funny to mention that actually when it talks about, you know, you shall not commit murder and all that, it's actually that's that's in the context of what it's talking about. It's actually laying a trap for someone to to actually commit genocide. That's what Yahuwah meant by you shall not murder. You'll see it many times in the Torah. That's the context of it, because he obviously there's other places where Yahuwah tells them to kill people. So, uh, so I think I think it's we got to keep the context of that Torah commandment in Exodus 20 is that it's talking about laying in wait for someone um, to actually you're setting a snare for someone to kill someone. Like for example, David. Okay, he sets a trap for. Uh, Uriah the Hittite that had, that had a wife. He set a trap for him to get killed so that he could take his wife. That that would be that you know breaking the commandment, "Thou shalt not murder." Yeah. Um, just one example. There's many examples of the context of "You shall not murder" because many people that are agnostic or atheists will point to that and they'll say, "See, that's a contradiction because he brought them into the land of Canaanites, told them to utterly commit genocide to those tribes." So how do, how do you have a verse that says you shall not murder and then, then the same lawgiver is telling you to murder people? So we, when we, we have to develop our apologetics to know how to rightly divide the word truth and to be able to tell people the context of these commandments. They're, they're missing the context. It's not about do not kill anyone or any, anything because then, then you can't eat meat then. Um, so yeah. it's important to, to know the context of things. So when it's talking about thou shalt not murder, it's actually talking about laying in wait for someone, laying in wait to, to kill someone for no reason. And the um, motive, the you know, motive that was there, you know, the reason. Uh, evil motive, he yeah. Would have never, he would have never thought to do that to him if it had not been for, you know, lust and, and there, he's supposed to be his brother. He's a fellow Israelite. You know, so he, for how, I don't know how it happened that a Hittite was, you know, completely human and Israelite. I, I, I don't know yeah. that somehow that happened, you know, somehow, I mean, Yahuwah can do anything. He can fix a gene genetics. So, Hey, he is somehow it happened. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, but anyway, uh, so let's see a righteous king establishes a country, but a transgressor destroys all right so transgressor destroys a nation mm -hmm. while a righteous king establishes a nation okay uh let's see here now we're going to chapter 28 all right so let's go to chapter 28 see if we have any notes here after that i'll be going to brother joshua he's been waiting patiently he's had his hand up for a while so let me just do these quick cross references here <sighs> okay he that trusts to a bold heart, this is talking about pride, such a one is a fool. But he that walks in wisdom shall be safe. All right. Pride is always the enemy. And that's why you who hate Satan. Uh, mm -hmm. Satan was the one that uh, was so prideful that he couldn't handle just being a servant. Okay. Mm -hmm. He that tills his own land shall be satisfied with bread, but he that follows idleness shall have plenty of poverty. This is a good lesson for a lot of us men that we get into uh, we get into this Hebrew roots, Torah keeping, and we forget about our worldly responsibilities. And I'm even talking, I'm preaching to the choir, to me here. 
Okay. When I first got into the Torah, that was something that I, I was rationalizing about, about getting a job. And, you know, uh, you know, I would say for my first six months as a baby in Torah, I was very lazy in that matter, being idle in that matter. So um, it's this, this verse is a very good reminder, in my opinion. It's a very good reminder, verse 19. Okay. Verse 17. Okay. Um, the Masoretic is missing the second half of the verse, which says, Chasten your son, and he shall love you. Oh, what a foreign concept. Especially to this world, they would say, how is he going to love you if you're chastening him? And give honor to your soul. He shall not obey a sinful nation. So if you are raising your child the right way, he would not want to obey a sinful nation. Mm -hmm. That's what that's saying there. Okay. All right. He, verse 10, he that causes upright men to error in the evil way himself shall fall into destruction. Transgressor <laughs> also shall pass by prosperity, but shall not enter into it. Okay. All right. Verse 9. This is a very important verse here, and this is a very popular one. I don't know how I never noticed this. I used to read Proverbs all the time, you know, even early in my Torah walk, and I never noticed this verse before. He that turn, he that turns away the his ear from hearing the law, even he has made his prayer abominable. So this is basically saying your prayers are just gonna hit the ceiling if yeah. if you're not caring about keeping the Father's commandments. Mm -hmm. If you don't even want to hear it and you're abs uh, obstinate towards the Torah, guess what? That that prayer ain't going past the ceiling. Mm -hmm. That's what it's saying. Okay. All right. Verse 7. A wise son keeps the law, but he that keeps up debauchery dishonors his father. I find it interesting. Uh, the Septuagint is ref referencing debauchery. Masoretic text is talking about a glutton. Now, both of them are bad, but I find interesting the Septuagint is more focusing on the bigger problem, the uh, sexual immorality or whoring. Mm. So, because um, don't get me wrong, gluttony is bad, you know, to overeat is yeah, bad. It's a different uh, thing. It's a different type of sin. Uh, debauchery, to me, it would be the stronger, the stronger oh, sure. of the two. It's talking about something even worse than gluttony would be a... a, a what is it talking about? Uh, a man whore or a whoremonger. Okay. So, and that's something too we talked about off the record. Whore is not just a female adjective. Okay. A man can be called a whore. You see, you see that in scripture that even though it's talking about Israel as a woman, prophetically, Obviously, there's male Israelites, so the males are yeah. included in that. So when it says, you know, you, when you have hoard with you have hoard with the nations, committed adultery with the nations, mm -hmm. committed adultery with Molech, that's including the male Israelites. Oh, of course, yeah. So that's just saying. Okay, so yeah, it's not true. it's not attacking women. Okay, that's true. So, all right. Anyway, just wanted to make mention of that. Um, brother Joshua, thank you for being so patient, brother. I, I'm going to let you go now and uh, mention what you want to mention. That was an old hand, Doug. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, cool. No problem. All right. So where is my... Uh, O-A-N-T. Oh, I'm going to go to my Aramaic New Testament here because we're about to read the last portion for Luke today. Nine. Uh, Luke 9 to 13. I think what we'll do is I'll split it up with my mom. I'll read two chapters. Yeah. She'll read two chapters just for us to get it done here. Okay. I'll be reading from my uh, favorite version of the New Testament here. 
This is, uh, let's see, you can get a good. The original Aramaic New Testament plain English with Psalms and Proverbs without notes by David Bousher, Reverend David Bousher. Okay. Hey, this is the Aramaic New Testament I would recommend for people to get. Um, it's the most accurate when you talk about the topic of the oneness. Um, it definitely shows that the apostles believed that Yahuwah and Yahusha were one. They were one single person. Um, there's a lot of good benefits on this version of the New Testament. Um, uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Okay, so where's Luke in this in this version? I'll tell you. So Luke would be page 70 in this translation. Okay. All right. So righty then. Okay. Luke chapter 9. All right. Here we go. And Yahushua called the twelve and gave power to them and authority over all the demons and diseases to heal and make hold the sick. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of Elohim and to heal the sick. And he said to them, You shall take nothing for the road, no staff, neither money, bag, nor bread. Neither tunics will be with you, and whatever house you enter, stay there from there, go out. Whoever does not receive you, whenever you leave that city, shake off even the sand of your feet against them for a witness. And the apostles went out and were walking around in the villages and cities, and they were preaching the glad tidings and healing to every place. But Herodias, and te the Tetrarch, heard all the things that were being done by his hand, and he was amazed because the people were saying Yohanan has arisen from the dead but others were saying Elias, a prophet among the ancient prophets had it arisen and Herodias said I have cut off the head of Yohanan who is this about who I have heard these things and when the apostles heard it, they were relating to Yahusha everything that they had done and he took them by themselves to a deserted region in Bathsaida. But when the crowds knew they went after and received them, he received them and he was speaking with them about the kingdom of Alua. And those who were in the need of, of, made, of being made whole, he made whole. But when he, the day came, began to decline, his disciples came and they were saying to him, Dismiss the crowds that they go to the surrounding villages and hamlets to lodge in them and to find provisions for themselves because we are in a deserted place. Yahushua said to them, you give them food, but they were saying we don't have more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy provisions for this entire people. For there remained about 5,000 men and Yahushua said, make them recline by groups of 50 men in a group. And the disciples did so, and they made them all recline. Yahushua took those five loaves and two fish. He gazed into heaven, and he baruched, and he broke, and he gave to his disciples to set before the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up fragments that remained, 12 large baskets. And when he was praying alone, his disciples were with him, and he asked them about, uh, he asked them, and he said, what is it? The crowds are saying about me who I am. They answered and they were saying to him, Yohanan the baptizer and others, Eliyahu and others, a prophet, one of the ancient prophets had arisen. But he said to them, who is it you are saying that I am? Simon answered and he said, the Messiah of Alua. But he admonished them. And he warned them that they should not say this to anyone. And he said to them, the son of man is going to suffer many things and to be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. They will murder him. And on the third day, he will rise. 
And he said before everyone, whoever is willing to come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his stake every day. Let him come after me. For whoever wills to save his life destroys it. Whoever will give up his life for my sake, this one saves it. For how would a man benefit to gain the whole world but destroy his soul or lose it? Whoever will be ashamed of me and of my words, of that one will the Son of Man be ashamed whenever he comes into the esteem of his Father with his set-apart angels. And the only way you'll understand what he's talking about, this idea of the Son of Man coming in his esteem, you don't really see that in the canon of the Old Testament other than the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. So unless you know Daniel 7, chapter 7, or the book of Enoch, you'll not mm -hmm. understand why he keeps referring to himself as this pre-incarnate, the son of man, the son of man, the son of man, mm -hmm. coming coming into the steam of his father, um, the the splendor of his father in in you know in the sky with his angels. This is a concept that's all over the book of the extra biblical book of Enoch. This is a concept that that uh, people of this time period would have understood. Uh, the book of Enoch, the majority of the book of Enoch was written around the time of the Septuagint, like second third century bc so yahushua's uh the concept of the son of man can only be pulled from two different sources it's either daniel he's using the concept or enoch that's our only choices there so anyway all right and i tell you the truth there are men who stand here who will not partake of death until they behold the kingdom of alua okay and we're we're going to get to that in the next chapter with what the context of that is. Okay. Uh, but it happened after these words about eight days later, Yahushua took Simon. Okay. They're actually going to go to it now. Okay. But it happened after these words were about eight days later. Interesting. The eighth day. Hmm. Because tabernacles, <laughs> the last great day is also known as the eighth day. And it's very uh, prophetic about that too. So, on the eighth day, Yahushua took Simon and Yaakov, which is James in your uh, your Greek New Testaments, and Yohanan, and he went up a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face transfigured and his garments became white. And they were shining. Okay. And behold, two men were speaking with him who are Masha and Eliyahu, who appeared in esteem. But they were speaking about his exodus, which was going to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. And Simon and those with him were groggy with sleep, and they awakened with difficulty, and they saw his esteem, and those who men, those two men who were standing with him, and when they began to part from him, Simon said to Yahusha, Rabbi, is it beautiful for us to be here? Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Masha, and one for Eliyahu. I wonder if tabernacles was happening at this point. Because yeah, now you, never know. you got the eighth day being referenced. Why is it referencing the eighth day if it's mm -hmm. not talking about the Feast of Tabernacles? And now they're making tabernacles, mm -hmm. booths for, you know. So I don't know. I'm just saying. All right. And he did not know what he said. And as he said these things, there was a cloud that formed a tabernacle about them. They were afraid when they beheld Masha and Eliyahu, who entered into the cloud. And there was a voice from the cloud that said, This is my son, the beloved. Hear him. And by the way, the beloved is another messianic title for the coming Messiah that... Uh, You'll find, you'll actually find in certain versions of the Bible, but especially in uh, extra biblical literature, you'll find, you'll find the, the, uh, the title for Yahushua, the beloved. And when the voice had occurred, Yahushua was found alone and they were silent and um, told no man in those days what they had seen. And it occurred the day after as they descended from the mountain, a great cross crowd met them and one man from that crowd called and he said teacher i beg you restore my son to me he is the only child i have and a spirit suddenly come upon him and suddenly he screams and gnashes his teeth 
and becomes ill and it departs from him with difficulty whenever it attacks him. And I begged of your disciples to cast it out and they could not. Yahushua answered and said, O oh, generation without belief and perverse, how long shall I be with you and endure you? Bring your son here. So notice how Yahushua is considering him lacking belief, but yet he knows Yahushua can do it. So Yahushua has to be referring to something else that, that there's not enough belief in him. There's, you know, there's not enough trust, you could say. Um, when he came near to him, that demon threw him down and convulsed him. And Yahushua rebuked the foul spirit, and he made whole the boy and gave him to his father. And they were all astonished at the majesty of Alihim. And as everyone was marveling at everything that Yahushua did, he said to his disciples, Put these words in your ears, for the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They did not understand the saying because it was hidden from them, lest they should perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about the saying. The deliberation entered among them of who was the great among them. But Yahushua knew the thought of their heart and took a boy and he stood him by him. He said to him, whoever receives a boy like this one in my name, that one receives me. Whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. For whoever is the least among you all, this one will be great. And Yohanan answered and said, our master, we saw a man who cast out a demon in your name, and we forbade him, for he does not come after you with us. Yahushua said to him, yeah, to put in modern terms, terminology, he's not in our camp. He's not in our club. He's not in our club. <laughs> he's not in our assembly. We forbade him. There you go. So, yeah, still happening today, unfortunately. Yeah. Not one of us. And Yohanan answered and said, Our master, we, so we forbade him, for he does not come after you with us. Yahushua said to them, You shall not forbid, for whoever is not against you is for you. And it was that when the days of his ascent were fulfilled, he prepared himself to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers before his presence. They went and entered a village of the Samaritans so as to prepare for him, and they did not receive him. Because his person was determined to go to Jerusalem. And when Yaakov and Yohanan, his disciples, saw it, they were saying to him, Our master, do you want us to speak? And fire will descend from heaven and will consume them, as a lot Eliyahu also did. So this is interesting. They're already seeing that he's the same being that caused fire to go down from heaven when Elijah prayed. And if you go to the book of Second Kings, Elijah is praying to the Father. So they're they're actually starting to put two and two together here, Jacob and uh, Jacob and John. He turned and he rebuked them and he said, "You do not know of which spirit you are, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy lives, but to give life." And they went to other villages. And as they were going on the road, a man said to him, "I shall come after you to the place that you will go." My master, Yahushua said to him, foxes have dens and the birds of the sky have shelters, but the son of man does not have a place to lay his head. And he said to another, come after me. And he said to him, my master, permit me first to go bury my father. Yahushua said to him, let the dead bury their dead and you go announce the kingdom of Elias. So basically what he's saying is, I need you to do this for me right now. This is more important. You, you know, the dead can bury the dead, right? Right now, I need you to be part of my ministry. So basically what he's saying is, who's more important, your dad, who's dead, or me? That's what, he, there's, there's that, that's what he's that saying. There's nothing that should be more important than that. Yeah. And that's, and so, that's how, so that, how that, he looks at it, and that, that's how it is. That's that's what he's basically saying. He's like, do you love your dad more than me? Right. Let let your that's dad, right. let, let the dead bury the dead. Mm -hmm. Okay. So verse 62, Yahushua said to him, no man lays his hands to the blade of the plow and gazes behind him and is fit for the kingdom of Alua. Basically meaning <clears throat> no man should be worried about gazing back at the old world, the sinful world. Mm -hmm. Okay, another so. one said, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Mm -hmm. That wasn't kosher either. 
You know, yeah. that that's another example of, you know. Well, Lot's wife. Mm-hmm. Yeah. After these things, Yahushua appointed another security of his disciples, chapter 10. Mm -hmm. And he sent them two by two before his presence to every place, city where he was prepared to go. And he said to them, the harvest is great and the workers are few. Pray, therefore, the master of the harvest is to send the workers to his harvest. So Yahushua is now calling himself the master of the harvest mm -hmm. in verse 2 here. But go, behold, I am sending you as sheep among wolves. You shall not take for yourselves money bags, nor wallets, nor sandals. Do not greet a man on the road. And to whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if a person, a son of peace is there, your peace shall rest upon it. But if not, it will return to you. But stay in that house while you are eating, drinking of what is theirs. For the worker is worthy of his fare. Meaning he's he's worthy of his, you know, basically he's worthy of his meat. Mm -hmm. okay? And do not move from house to house. Mm -hmm. In whatever city you enter, they receive you. Eat anything that is offered to you. Make whole those who are sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of Alu has come near you. Now, I want to I want to touch on that verse before going to verse 10. Okay, he's not saying go eat pig. Because I, I know some people are going to take no. that verse there. Eat whatever that's been put before you. He is not going to give them something that contradicts the Torah. No, no. Okay. Okay. So what he's saying is, as long as it's lawful, as long as it's mm -hmm. what you, who has mm -hmm. given us to eat, you know, right. first Timothy chapter four, but what he's been given as meat, which is broma. Okay. Foods that have been given by you who to receive. Okay. He's not going to contradict that. So he's basically saying, eating, eat whatever is offered to you. Trust them. They're not going to give you meat sacrifice idols. So that's that's really what he's saying there. Okay. And make whole those who are sick in it. Say to them, the kingdom of Alu has come near. But whichever city you enter, and they will now receive you. Go out to the street and say, even the sand that cleaves to our feet from city from your city, wipe off unto you. You know this. The kingdom of Alu has come near to you. Okay. I say to you that it shall be pleasant for Sodom in that day compared to that city. Woe to you, Chorazim. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Because if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon that have occurred in you, they doubtless would have repented in sackcloth and in ashes. Yet for Tyre and Sidon, it shall be pleasant in the day of judgment compared to you. And you, Capernaum. So Yahushua is actually talking about the cities of Jerusalem in context here. Mm -hmm. um, and you, Capernaum, she that was exalted unto heaven, mm -hmm. you shall be debased unto Sheol. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. Whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. And those 70 whom he had sent returned to the great joy. And they were saying to him, our master, even the demons are subject to us in your name. But he said to them, I was beholding Satan himself who fell like lightning from heaven. Notice how through the whole Tanakh, we never get a direct quote of, of a past tense that Satan fell until this point. So this is why I believe Satan fell, literally was cast out of heaven physically to the earth when Yahushua was being born on earth, um, according to Revelation 12. So that's why I believe he wasn't literally cast to the earth. He might have fell from heaven as far as fallen from his original state, but he didn't physically get thrown to the ground un, or, or physically kicked fully out of heaven until, un, until Yahushua came and, you know, took on the flesh of a baby. Okay. But anyway, um, verse 19, behold, I have given you authority that you may tread on snakes and scorpions, all the power of the enemy, and nothing will harm you. By the way, this is a concept Yahushua is pulling from in Psalms 91 verse 13, which actually says, um, you know, uh, those that trust in, those are in the shadow of the almighty. Um, so they, they will be able to tread on the basilisk, on the dragon, so on and so forth. However, okay, so 
verse 20. However, you should not rejoice in this, that demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And in that hour, Yahushua should triumph in the spirit of set apartness. And he said, I thank you, my father, master of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and have revealed them to infants. Yes, my father, for thus it was your pleasure before you. And he turned to his disciples and said to them, everything that has been delivered to me from my father, no man knows who the father, who, who the son is except the father only and who the father is except the son and he to whom the son will be pleased to reveal him. And he turned to his disciples by themselves and said, Baruch are those eyes that are seen, whatever you're seeing. For I say unto you that many prophets and kings have desired to see these things that you are seeing. And they have not seen it to hear the things that you are hearing and they have not heard. And behold, a scribe arose to test him and said, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Yahushua said to him, How is it written in the Torah? How do you read it? He answered and he said to him, you shall love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, from all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Yahushua said to him, you have said correctly, do this and you shall live. But as he wanted to declare himself righteous, he said to him, and who is my neighbor? And Yahushua said to him, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and robbers fell upon him. And they plundered and beat him and left him when little life remained in him. And they departed. And it happened a certain priest was going down that road and he saw him pass by. And also a Levite coming arrived that place and he saw him and he passed by. But a Samaritan man, as he traveled, came where he was and he saw him and he took pity on him. And he came and bound his wounds and poured wine and oil on them and set him on his donkey and he took him to an inn and cared for him and at the break of the day he produced two denarii gave them to the innkeeper and said to them take care of him and if you spend anything more whenever i return i will give it to you whoever therefore these three appears to you to have been a neighbor to him who fell into the hands of robbers but he said who he who took pity on him Yahushua said to him, you go and do likewise. And it was that when they were traveling on a road, he entered a certain village and a woman whose name was Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister whose name was Miriam. And she came and sat herself at the feet of the, our master. And she was listening to his words. But Martha was busy with serving many things and came and said to him, my master, does it not concern you that my sister has left me alone to serve? Tell her to help me. But Yahushua answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you take pains and are troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Miriam has chosen that toe part for herself, which will not be taken away from her. We are, um, my, my mom's going to be starting chapter 11 for us. <clears throat> okay. One day Yahushua was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Master, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed or set apart be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give you the bread, because he is his friend, yet because of the man's persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, 
he will give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Yahushua was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been dumb spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Yahushua knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of Yahuwah, then the kingdom of Yahuwah has come to you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. When an evil or unclean spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. As Yahushua was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Baruch is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, Baruch rather are those who hear the word of Yahuwah and obey it. As the crowds increased, Yahushua said, this is a wicked generation. It asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South, interesting little flashback to Daniel, the Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now one greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now one greater than Jonah is here. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, it puts it on a stand so that those who come in may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body, of your whole body, also is full of light. But when they are bad, your body also is full of darkness. See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and a bit dark, it will be completely lightened as when the light of a lamp shines on you. When Yahushua had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee noticed that Yahushua did not first wash before the meal was surprised. Then, then Yahushua said to him, Now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also, but give what is inside the dish to the poor and everything will be clean for you? Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give Yahuwah a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs. But you neglect justice and the love of Yahuwah. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves, which men walk over without knowing it. One of the experts in the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. You who should reply, and you experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourself will not lift one finger to help them. 
Woe to you because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your forefathers who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your forefathers did. They killed the prophets, and you built their tombs. Because of this, Yahuwah in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and angels, some of whom they will kill, and others they will persecute. Their generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Woe to you experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who were entering. When Yeshua left there, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to beseech him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he would say. And encouragements. Meanwhile, one of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another. Yahushua began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the housetops. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after the killing of the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by Yahuwah. Indeed, the very hairs on your head are all don't be afraid, you are worth more than many sparrows. I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of Yahuwah. But he who disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of Yahuwah. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. <clears throat> When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourself or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. <clears throat> Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Yahushua replied, Men, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told him this parable. <clears throat> the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And Yahuwah said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward Yahuwah. Then Yahushua said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more important than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens, they do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet Yahuwah feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Woe of you by worrying can add, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how Yahuwah clothes the grass of the field, 
which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not set your hearts on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, banquet so that when he comes to knock, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth. He will dress himself to serve, have, have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Peter asked, Master, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? Um, Yahushua answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth. He will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming, and he then begins to beat the man's servant and the woman's servant and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and in, at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. That servant who knows the mas his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does, does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much will be asked, much more will be asked. I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wished it were already kindled but I have a baptism to undergo, and how, how distressed I am until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five and one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided. Father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, it's going to rain, and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time. Why don't you judge for yourself what is right? As you are going with your adversary to the magistrate, try hard to be reconciled to him on the way, or he may drag you off to the judge, and the judge turn you over to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Okay, and 13 also, right, hon? Yeah. Okay. Now, there were some present at that time who told Yahushua about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Yahushua answered, do you think that these Galileans 
were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish, or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming back to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down, why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. On a Sabbath, Yahushua was teaching in one of the synagogues and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Yahushua saw her, he called her forward and said to her, when you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised Yahuwah. Indignant because Yahusha had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, there are six, six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. Yahuwah answered him, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie this ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Then Yahushua asked, what is the kingdom of Yahuwah like? What shall I compare it to? It's like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew, became a tree, and the birds of the air perched in its branches. Again he asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of Yahuwah to? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked through the whole dough through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Master, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter. happened hola where are you guys at hola can't hear you yahoo i can't hear you think you're guys. muted doug I think he is muted. Maybe uh maybe their internet's out, bro. How you doing, Mijo? Joshua? I'm doing Josh? pretty good. You yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Is it pretty hot over there? Uh, I'm actually out in Paso Robles right now, so it's pretty good. Oh, you're in LA. Kind of like, right? Yeah, next to like Morrow Bay. Uh, oh, um, it's right. uh, Tascadero. Oh. Okay. Everything's going good, babe? Yeah, it's going pretty good. I'm just out here um, spending some time with Abba closer to the beach, closer um, away from uh, you know there's Tora County out there. Uh, there's what? Tora is, is out there somewhere. 
that there is a community growing in Torah out there that you could maybe go ahead, mom. Sister, 14. No, uh, you just finished 13. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. Our uh, internet decided to go out towards the end of the chapter. Sorry about that, everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah, our internet's been doing bad all day. I don't know if it's the weather or what, but um, I just want to thank everyone for uh, joining, hanging in there with us today. It was a, a very long meeting. Yes, yes, so yes. I just want to thank you, YouTube. Thank you, F Facebook and YouTube, who will be seeing this later on tonight, because I'll probably be getting uh, Yahuwah willing, getting the videos up pretty quickly. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, so, so anyway, um, please stay tuned. I'm pretty sure we're going to be doing a couple studies in the future on certain topics coming up. Um, how to find Yahushua in, in the Tanakh without using the New Testament um, as a witnessing type of tool. So we'll probably be doing a study like that soon. And we're going to do another study about uh, whether Satan was really a covering cherub or not. So those two topic studies we'll be doing soon. And so anyway, so thank you everyone for joining us today to all of our brothers and sisters that are, uh, it's still the Sabbath for them. Have a great rest of your Shabbat. Laila Tova, everyone. Shalom. All right.